This video is sponsored by Wildlife Command Center Coffee. More about them at the end of the video. Hey everybody, it's me, John Ward, and I am back with another One Filmmaker, One Film. And today, my guests are... Paul Ragsdale. Angie the Elbow. And we are a and Productions. And you get two for the price of one. Two for the price of one. Yes. Uh, we are the makers of Cinco de Mayo, Streets of Vengeance, and our latest movie, Slash Alert Party. Yes, and I have some of those here. Um, I'm going to show off my, my collection for people. So here we have the, the Blu-ray for Slash Red Party. Awesome. All signed by, by like cast and crew. Yeah. There we go. Try to get, I never know where to put it. There it is. Try to get it out of the light and, and then yeah, we got the back. Rare. Awesome. And it's, it's got like a nice, cause this is the Blu-ray. So it's, man, yep. there we go. So it looks yeah. good. That, that's a good picture of all of them right there. And yeah, then, <laughs> oh, well, good, good job. Um, then yeah. we have uh, one of the original Cinco de Mayo's. Ooh, OG slash, slash video That's Cinco de Mayo. Back. Oh my gosh. And it's Those got the, the numbers Perfect. up there and, and uh, it's all signed. It, 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 the signatures yeah. even go on to the back. <laughs> and <laughs> got the inside. Awesome. You guys good, did good jobs on this. Now, this is the slasher one, that olive one. Um, so this is the, the second version, I guess, that came out of it. Yeah, yeah. that's when the slasher video was picked up by Olive Films, so they re-released it. Um, Blu-ray and DVD. Great. Great artwork. Wow, you got both versions. Yeah. Yep, and then we got the inside here. Awesome. Which they decided to advertise more of their movies here instead of having a picture <laughs> up of yours, but... But I guess that, that's uh, what I mean. Man, there we that's, go. Uh, that's the <laughs> Welch movie. Oh, great. And then we got uh, Streets of Vengeance. So we yeah. got that yeah. one there. Oh, yeah, all, yeah. Right. all signed. So that looks good. Yeah, yeah. the DIY one. Mm -hmm. Yep. And yeah, that version's out of print. There, there's, there's extra scenes on that version that are not on the official release. So. Oh, on this one? Rare one. Yeah. Oh, nice, because I want to get the other one, too. So this one came with two cards in it. And it's this tells you how, how, how like you said, <laughs> like, like original, like OG, you know, yeah, do it yourself. Well, I mean, you got the handwritten right there. SOV the screener, not, not, not even the name of the movies on there, SOV screener. And then yeah, we got the a button. The theater. Yeah. Yeah, but I've never taken the button out because I figured you guys put it in there. I'm going to leave it in. I don't want to lose that. It's, it's, Keep it safe. Yeah, and, and it fits in there perfectly. So I think you have more of our work than we do. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I, I, oh, sure, you're welcome. I, I never get rid of this stuff. I don't care how many updated copies I get. Um, uh, that's it, it's yeah. I think I own like three or four copies of some films. You know, some people's movies just because they keep bringing out from different distributors and it's like i'll support it so you know i'll, I'll pick it up so um oh, man. we appreciate the oh, filming oh yeah of course yeah. oh yeah of course. And, and i want to thank both of you for being here i really appreciate it this is an honor and a treat it's rare when i get to re you know actually do an interview with two people so i, I really appreciate that yeah. i can get twice the amount of information thank both of us. Yeah, thank you. oh of course <laughs> yeah I've, hopefully I, yeah. <laughs> It'll be twice as fun. Too. Yes, I think it will be. And I've wanted to actually have you on for a while. Um, there's certain filmmakers that that I've wanted to have on. It's just people just keep getting pushed, unfortunately, for various reasons. So I'm, I'm glad to have you at least have you on for season three. So I wanted you more like season two, season one. But here we are in season three. Luckily, there's only 10 episodes per season. So people can get on pretty quickly. So um, but today we are talking yeah, about Slash Lorette Party. This is the film that uh, that we're going to be discussing. Is up? No, nope, there it goes. And um, so yeah. my my first question on this. Well, it's a brand new film. Like you say it's 2020. Um, it runs 79 yeah. minutes, which is a good time. 79 minutes, 80 minutes, good time. Never boring. Um, I really enjoyed yeah. the film. Um, it right. never lags. 
Um, it has good photography, good editing. Uh, the music is really good, very 80s sounding. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. Um, so those are certain things that, that I made notes of. And um, so how did you guys, um, or Guy and Gal, uh, come up with the idea for this. <laughs> I never know these days. Like, can I say guys and that's okay? And it means both male and female, or do yeah. I need to say guy I'm, and gal? <laughs> well, guys, is, guys is fun. Or okay. girls, that's fine. <laughs> so, <laughs> gals, hey, what did you gals, you know, how'd you come up? Um, how did you come Most up with gals. the, uh, yeah, you know, whatever. I mean, these days, I guess. Um, how did you come up with the uh, idea for this film? Um, well, if you've seen Cinco de Mayo, um, that movie has a wraparound segment called All Night Long, and it's a lot like um, USA Up All Night with Ronda Sherry. We have a host and stuff. And in the middle of Cinco de Mayo, there's a, a cut through a commercial, a fake trailer for a fake movie called Dance Team Dark. So when we did Streets of Vengeance, we wanted to do the same thing. It has the same wraparound up all, uh, all night long with Space Team Monroe, and we needed a trailer to go in the middle of Streets of Vengeance. And we had previously had a trailer called Tough Guys. It was like a really bro, really masculine fight, beat em up type of movie. <laughs> Street yeah, Street Fire, like Double Dragon kind of a movie. And that played when we did the, the Indiegogo version. That has tough guys on it. Um, but then after a few screenings around, we kind of thought maybe it didn't really fit the Streets of Vengeance vibe. So we wanted to make another one. Uh, and a friend of ours had proposed an idea of doing like a, a, a slasher film in the woods. Uh, he proposed to do like in a barn or something. And so we kind of took that idea and said, well, let's do a cabin and slasher or slasher movie in the cabin movie, yeah. uh, slasher in the cabin movie. We've never done one before. Since Streets of Vengeance has like an 80s vibe to it, we wanted to do a fake trailer that also kind of carried a fake, yeah. like an 80s vibe. Right. So the fake trailer we chose to do was for Slash Lord Party. Right. And we okay. thought, this is so ludicrous. It sounds ridiculous. <laughs> mm-hmm. Like it's so cheesy and over the top. It sounds so silly and we thought it would just be a fake trailer and that would be the end of it but <laughs> after the movie came out and it got officially distributed yeah. people would see that fake trailer for slash web party and they're like is this a real movie yeah. where, where can we watch it and we're like no 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 that's just a cheesy <laughs> like funny thing that we came up with yeah it, it, and all the reviews we were getting it kept mentioning slash web party and everybody kept saying please make this make a this real movie, movie. <laughs> and we're like what and did that to our last big trailer, Dance to You Die, as well. And it was even in a magazine and said, You need to make this movie. And so, with Slash Art Party, we, we didn't do it for Dance to You Die, but for Slash Art Party, we thought, Well, maybe we can do it. You know, like there, there's something that interests us, like to try and make a slasher, Cabin in the Woods slasher movie. And so, there's just so many people that just like the idea. It's like, Well, why not? Let's give it a shot since so many people want it. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and that's a, um, I don't know exactly how to say it. It's like, it's a good thing and a bad thing, but I don't want to say bad thing necessarily because a lot of people do these kind of fake trailers mm-hmm. and, and including people, you know, Grindhouse did it with, you know, uh, yeah. you know, Robert Rodriguez and Tarantino. And then like yeah. when Rob Zombie Rob did his, yeah, everybody wanted Rob Zombie mm-hmm. to do that trailer, you know, or the uh, yeah. Thanksgiving trailer machete. Yeah, into right. yeah. Machete. Yeah, that's another one that, yeah. that did it. So I guess you have to, if you're going to be putting fake trailers on your movies and you made those fake trailers, mm-hmm. if you make like two or three of them, expect one of them to just boom. And then everybody's going to say, right. can I watch this movie? And for you, that ended up being mm-hmm. Slasherette Party. <laughs> yeah, yeah like, I take my money now. I know. I resisted as long as I could because I didn't want to make it, but they pulled me over to the dark side. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it was like, you know, how can we how can we make this into a full length you know, feature, you know? And what's different from the trailer is like, you know, it's just all all women, all females. And then for the movie, we expand it to co-ed. So it's guys and girls. Um, add more victims, you know, add more drama. Um, you know, it's one of the one of the many changes that we made you know, to the film. And how do both of you, because you're you're both of you are big parts in, in these films. I only have written down a couple things. So I have that the film is both written and directed by both of you, but I also, and, and Paul, you did editing on it and then producer. I mean, it, it's just, how do you guys divide up all this? Cause when I was watching those credits, both of your names were on a lot of credits. How, how do you divide that up between you two? 
we keep things, I mean, as an independent filmmaker, I'm sure you know this very well, but you, you have to work uh, on a very small budget, on a very quick schedule with the small, smallest amount of resources as possible. Small crew as well. So if doing it's everything. possible for us to take a task, we will take it rather than bring on an extra person. And we've been doing this now for about 10 years. So we kind of have like our groove as far as like what our duties are. Mm -hmm. um, Paul is a very committed writer. So every day he's writing, 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 writing something. And usually he will only you know, pitch stuff to me if he's like kind of stuck on a, should it go this way or this way? Or why would this person do this? And yeah. we kind of talk through themes and characters and stuff. I'm more Story of an idea person and he'll write down all the stuff we talk about. Mm -hmm. So technically we both write, yeah. but he's the actual typer. He's a writer. Um, as far as um, the other stuff, I don't like, know. Like, well, directing, like, well, she, she does a lot of the art direction. She does a lot of, the, she, she did all the costumes. You know, we went shopping together. She picked all the color, uh, everything that everyone, that the girls are wearing, the guys was yeah. all picked out. We didn't ask anyone to really bring anything, even the oh. shoes, we would pick out the shoes. So oh, wow. She did that. Um, yeah, typically we, I do like all the photos. Same goes with Shoes of Vengeance. Costumes, uh, locations, like I do a lot of that and all the, um, like getting the insurance worked out for mm -hmm. like the locations mm -hmm. and um, a lot of the scheduling and a lot of the communication with the cast if they have questions about things, mm -hmm. all the prep work, scheduling. Um, usually I take care of all that stuff and then Paul's more heavy on the directing, even though we do it together. We but the thing is, we, we've talked about it before we get to set. So instead of both of us giving orders, we both know what we want and already know, you know, we're on the same page. So I can just be the one giving them orders or telling them what to do because it's something we both talked about already. Yeah. So we don't need to really confer too much on set. Like, oh, what should we, unless something, you know, weird happens or it's like something that, you Unexpected. know, right, an accident or something or an incident, then we'll have to confer like, hey, what should we do? Should we do this? Should we do that? But beforehand we've discussed it already so they can the actors or the i was gonna say crew there is no crew it's just us anybody on set can go to either one of us and we'll know exactly what the plan is right. so because it's just the two of us dividing everything right. pretty much yeah that's awesome and awesome. so when you're on set do you at times like does one person let's say the slate like, it doesn't matter who does the slate between both of you. Like, it just whoever needs to do the slate does the slate, or whoever needs to do catering does catering. Is it that type of thing, or is it more of, would you just rather well, have somebody else, like like a crew member, do this, that type of stuff? Yeah, with this one, because we work with such a small crew, Streets of Vengeance was the first film that we did with a cinematographer. We did that with Dan Sampa, and he, did, he was a cinematographer on this one as well. So we added one person the last movie and then for this movie we actually added another person uh, angie's mom and she did the catering she she we were all we we're all living at the cabin for like three days shooting you know non-stop so she would make breakfast lunch and dinner for the cast and crew or not crew, but the cast and they would have you know home cooked meals to oh eat. that's so, so nice she was in charge of that so we didn't have to worry about that normally we would like order pizza or order chipotle or subway or whatever <laughs> that's what we did on, on streets of vengeance this time we didn't have to worry about that at all so it was a great great improvement uh to our shooting situation because we didn't have to worry it's like oh she's like oh it's uh 20 minutes it'll be done like, oh okay great that's shooting and then 20 minutes comes we'll take a break and everybody can eat so it kept everybody happy it kept us you know from having to worry about that so that was a great great improvement on this movie to have a caterer to have someone actually make the food yeah, that that homemade yeah. food you 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 can't beat it. I mean, it's yep. I mean that that would that would get me to come on set right there. Just oh yeah, we're gonna have homemade food. I'm there, <laughs> <laughs> and it was good too. Everyone loved it. Everyone couldn't stop eating. So yeah, well, we it was shot awesome. uh, the cabin was up in Pinecrest, which mm -hmm. is pretty far to if you wanted to leave and go get something to eat. Yeah. So we we're just telling everybody to save. You save the hassle of having to go anywhere if you guys are all okay with just staying here mm -hmm. and we had uh, i checked with everybody beforehand you know right. is there any allergies is there any dietary yeah, yeah. dietary needs like, oh yeah, a yeah. Whole 
in advance. Mm -hmm. uh, so everybody knew exactly what like the food was going to be in advance. Yep. And uh, it was fine. It was like tons of food, snacks. Yeah, they had pancakes and French toast and waffles <laughs> and eggs. I'm getting hungry. Bacon, <laughs> breakfast, I know. And yeah, they ate really, really, really good. We all did. Um, I, oh, I'm sorry, I can't give you any, but as far as like the other roles, like I was doing sound, Angie was making sure everyone did their costume changes and made sure they had their bows on and their <laughs> wristlets and their shoes. And so they would go to her for all that kind of stuff. And then they would come to me when they said, what, what scene are we shooting? And or I deal with Dan, the, the cinematographer. So that's how we kind of split our, our roles together. So we're attacking it at the same time, you know. Not, not, not taking advantage of our time. So well, we both alternate, like if somebody's got to jump in there and hold the boom mic mm -hmm. or hold something or Paul's like, oh, can you make sure this goes okay? And I'm going to be doing this. Yeah. Like we can very easily jump into each other's roles. Yeah. Do you, since Paul's more of the writer guy and he's, you know, in his room by himself and he's typing away and <laughs> then Angie needs to see the script because you're the producer, you know, do you find that you got to go no you know we can't have 10 soldiers oh we can God. have one no oh, yeah, we can't blow up. up a building <laughs> all right the source up thank you thank you for that <laughs> okay. yes yes well for slash web party not as much but for streets okay. of vengeance how yes. many times i've had to tell him like we can't we can't get access to tanks okay we can't kick someone's head off okay in, into the space <laughs> no, it's like um, off a building. That's then, all. Just kick his head off, off a building. No big deal. <laughs> yeah, oh times. But yeah, that was the original and end then, of Streets of Vengeance. And then the devil comes out. No, he's always writing like these crazy, like over the top things. And then I feel like the mean person that's like, we can't do that. No <laughs> way we can get that done. No, no, no. Yes. And then you're not going to like reading Russell Babes and have to do massacre. That's I know. <laughs> I know. But, well, do you, yeah, do you so feel that it's better to go big and then scale it down or just try to scale it down to begin with? Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, no. At this point, I tell him yeah. to just like run wild with his ideas. And then I'm so cheap and resourceful that I will try to find a way to make it happen. But yeah. And I don't go too wild. You know, I'll throw in a, a decapitation here and there. You know, but <laughs> nothing too crazy. Um, the devil didn't make it in the last one, but the devil will make it in the next. We'll see. We just weren't ready for it. We'll see. <laughs> 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 I try to like make it into a uh, reality, so to speak, budget wise. Yeah, practical, you know? yeah, practical. Yeah, yeah. Um, but so I we can actually achieve. You know? Prefer that he would write it just free and crazy as much as he wants, and then that's part of the fun of it to see if like, oh, can we? Right. Kick somebody's head off. Like, right. I mean, can we blow that up? I, I mean, because I mean, there's those kinds of things that are crazy, <laughs> but there are other things that are just like that we didn't know we could pull off anyway. Like I'm just gonna use Streets of Vengeance. Having a mansion, I didn't know anyone that had a mansion. Uh, a strip club, I didn't know anybody that had a strip club. But we wrote them, and then we sought out to try to find those things, and we did leave the possibility of okay, if that doesn't work out, we have a plan B. We can shoot in our garage or something. Yeah. But it gave us a goal. It, we gave ourselves like two weeks in some instances to get the location. And a lot of times we found it. And yeah. so that has kind of proved a pretty good formula. Yeah. That if we have a, a goal that's not too crazy, but it is something we don't have. Have like a wish list. Yeah. And, and it's yeah, a okay. wish list. <laughs> yeah. And we have a deadline. A deadline. Mm -hmm. And it's like, okay, yeah, we can get it. You know, um, that's, you know, that's kind of how we did everything. Everything we did. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, right, plan B is important. It's always important to have a plan B. I, I, I sadly only normally have plan A and then I freak out and, and then have a plan B, but good to have a plan A yeah. and B back to back. So yeah. leave the freak out yes, out. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, so uh, how did you figure your, uh, like, how did you determine your budget for, for Slash Rat Party? Uh, just going back off the budget of our previous movies, uh, Streets of Vengeance, for instance, was done for about four thousand dollars, maybe five, almost five. Not even, I don't think even five, like four. So we thought, okay, a Cabin in the Woods movie that should be very doable. Less locations than Streets of Vengeance had, had a lot of locations. Less people, had a lot of people. We could probably do it for five. That was like our our goal on Indiegogo. We thought let's just do it for five, you know, be 
pretty simple. We budgeted out that we're going to hire like a makeup person to do the effects and stuff and, you know, budget out for music. Um, paying the actors. Right, paying the actors as well. Costumes. The food, we the were, cabin rental. Yeah, we were anticipating renting locations, like mm-hmm. a cabin and locations and mm-hmm. stuff like that. We got really lucky on a lot of things that. Yeah, a lot of things we got for free. Yeah. So we got like a church for free, a cabin for free. Uh, I only had to pay for um, additional housing for because a lot of people there. I, you know, rented another cabin, and then then the food, you know, was only like four hundred dollars mm-hmm. or something like that. But we got a lot of food because we went to Costco, and they just her and her mom oh. did really good on the shopping. Wow. You know, we didn't skimp out like, on any less quality. It's just like you know, it's being smart about oh, get a lot of this, so get a lot of fruit, or you know, not oh, maybe to not waste it on things that probably wouldn't be eaten. So we're very frugal. You know, try to map things out and um we had a five thousand dollar goal but we are um, i think we earned eight seven, seven, seven something seven three or seven five or something yeah. like that so so we went over our goal and that was great and it paid for everything um the costumes the props the we ended up having to do the blood and the effect stuff ourselves and with some help from um, Devin and Jasmine March uh, the Gore Lords mm-hmm. and so they helped us so they and paid for um, like Flights for Ginger and Drew to come. Ginger and Drew, right? And we paid for their flights to hotels the and rental the cars. rental car. Yeah. So yeah, it, it helped. We, we spent every penny of that on the film itself, and uh, and then we paid all the actors. Right. Right, and that was a, a first time for us too, because with Streets of Vengeance, we didn't pay everybody. It, the, only like the main characters paid got paid, but this time, like everyone who appeared in the movie. Got paid. Oh, okay. A little bit. Not <laughs> Okay, and this kind of falls into the uh, the pre production uh, uh, part. So it's now you had mentioned a uh, f- free cabin, or f- is that what you had said that you shot up? Uh, yeah, it was a free cabin. Yeah, the main cabin that the movie takes place in was free. It was wow. a friend of one of the actors. Yeah, one of the actors had a family friend that owned a place in Pinecrest, mm-hmm. so we got that connection. Fortunately, uh, for that majority of the shoot and we just had to rent one that was slightly down the street a little bit yeah, for almost next we door. split half the cast stayed in the main cabin where we shot the film and the other half stayed at the cabin down the street yeah but wow it was kind of wow. and then at night when we shot like through the night a lot of nights and then uh everybody ended up wanting to stay at the main cabin because <laughs> they wanted to watch the right. filming <laughs> go on but there was an extra backup cabin so if anybody wanted to go sleep and rest away from us too. yeah yeah so we lucked out again a free cabin but we were prepared to rent our own basically because of the indiegogo funds yeah that that's that's amazing because that was a good looking cab is it an actual cabin i mean it looks more like a house yeah it's a cabin yeah <clears throat> wow because yeah. it's pretty big it's just yeah. down the ways a little bit from pinecrest lake yeah it's like right near the lake so mm. it's pretty close yeah, very nice. Did you have any problems shooting there at all? Like, would people see you, you know, running around with weapons and blood? And <laughs> <laughs> we thought we were going to get a lot of uh, trouble, but no, we 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 tried to tell the neighbors around what we were going to do, and we tried to tell the rangers, uh, but no one was there when we went by. And then the ranger, uh, we had an actress um, set up down the street. She was going to pull up in a car. And the rangers pulled up to her and they're like, hey, you guys making a movie? And like, uh, yeah. Like, oh, is it Slash and Wet Party? Yeah, we saw the trailer on YouTube. And I was like, ah. they were cool. They were, they were cool. They, they didn't give us no trouble at all. We were running around. People were, girls are screaming, running around the cabin and stuff. And, you know, everyone was having fun all night long. And, yeah, no one no one complained at all. <coughs> Very That's lucky. Nice. I mean, you, you are... Sometimes like security and, and cops can be pretty cool with that type of stuff, you know, as long as you're, you know, keeping it kind of condensed, you know, keeping it into the one area and you're not causing problems or being really noisy for neighbors and stuff. I mean, I've come across that a few times now and haven't had a problem. So it, it's just, yeah. I guess it just uh, kind of matters how you handle it and present yourself, you know? Yeah, totally. Definitely. Yeah, but you lucked out. Yeah, they were really cool. Yeah, that's that's great. Yeah, when when we were shooting uh, Midok Massacre four, the uh, the we were shooting the ending scene, 
And the lead actress, Mindy, would run out of the bar screaming her head off. And then the guy playing <laughs> Bubba would come out chasing her with a machete, basically. And eventually, after like the fifth try, because apparently I'm, I'm Kubrick, I do like 10 takes of everything, and I just don't have the talent. But um, eventually a, a cop helicopter showed up and we had all these beams on us and cop cars showed up because a neighbor said we were killing people. And then once they realized we were making a film, they were taking photographs with the actors. They're like, you know, we can't be on film because it would have been great wow. to have all these cop cars for production value. Yeah. But they're like, yeah, we, we can't be on film. But they took photos and we gave them <laughs> posters. And they're like, okay, bye. Have fun. So like, can you guys come you guys back up and come rush the set again? So oh, that would have been. Yeah, <laughs> man, that would have been great to just have that camera go out there and look at the helicopter above. And there's the cop cars approaching. And yeah, oh, they, they, they just couldn't do it, unfortunately. <laughs> Yeah. It's like a, a, a something with, yeah, it's like a law that they, they can't do it. So, but so, yeah, so every once in a while you come across these cool cops and security guards that are, that are fine. So um, what about actors? How do, uh, now, of course, Drew Marvick, we know that, um, you know, um, Ginger Lynn Allen is in this. And so how, how do you go about getting these people? What was your casting process like? Okay, where should we start? Um, I mean, normally we go, we live in Modesto, California, and there's a big theater scene out here. So normally we go to plays and we'd find people that way. Uh, like for the Sasha Party trailer, we worked with a lot of people for the first time. They had contacted us because I had posted on Facebook, oh, I want to do a slasher, Cabin in the Woods slasher movie. And that's all. And people are like, I want to be in this. You know, they don't know nothing else about the story. They just <laughs> slasher, Cabin in the Woods. And so we got a lot of people um, came from that um, that were working for the first time. So we brought most of them back uh, for, uh, for the full length feature. And then we also had a couple of actors that we worked with before, like for the like, last 10 years, uh, Daniel James Moody and Robert Holloway. They've been in Streets of Vengeance and some of them were in uh, Russell Odetta, a rough cut, a couple of other movies, Think of the Mind as well. Uh, so we brought them along. Uh, a couple of other people just kind of know us just around town, you know, just for making movies out here. And they're friends of friends. Oh, hey, I saw my friend in that movie. Oh, I, I was at your premiere and I wanted to meet you and I want to be in your movie. So it's kind of like a lot of that. Um, All over the place. One of the girls we met because we used to go to Chipotle every day. <laughs> right. She was the manager. She worked there. And we got really cool with her and her sister that both worked there. And we looked at her sister on something else. And then we we're like, oh, we need to get you in something. And so now she's. Oh, that's cool. Right. <laughs> and then one of the other girls was my coworker that we just worked at our office job together. Mm -hmm. And she was like, oh, I'm definitely interested in, in doing something with you guys again. And I was mm -hmm. like, I got something right now working on. So uh, <coughs> a lot me, of sorry. first time, well, okay, a lot of first time actors in, in this. Um, it's kind of uh, even balanced because there's a lot of new first timers and then there's a lot of veteran people that have a lot mm -hmm. of experience. So yeah, yeah. For instance, like um, Devin, <coughs> uh, Devin and Jasmine March, they're a couple. They have a podcast of the Gore Lords. We met them at a horror convention. Um, and they did a review of our movie Streets of Vengeance. You know, kind of talked, you know, they're into horror and stuff. And we invited them to audition for Slash Art Party. We had auditions and we met with some people, a uh, local uh, coffee house. And they came out and we talked to them and, you know, we liked them. So I said, yeah, just come on, come, come along with us. You know, they didn't know us really that well. They didn't know anyone else either. <laughs> but when they got there, they became you know, friends with everybody very quickly. And then of course, you know, Ginger Lynn, we worked with her on Streets of Vengeance and she's so nice to us, so sweet. She told me like, you know, like, oh, Streets of Vengeance is one of my main, uh, my best mainstream movies I've ever done. So oh, like, nice. So touch on that. Yeah, like, you know, she didn't have to say that. So I was like, well, if I'm writing something for you again. And she said, yeah, I would love to be in it. We, she invited us to her home in Vegas and um, Drew came out there to, to meet with us and we talked about the script with both of them, and then uh, we got them to sign on to the movie. And then Drew, we had met at a horror convention as well uh, in Sacramento. And again, he invited us. I like Pool Party Massacre. He likes Shoots of Vengeance. Just kind of uh, broed it up right there. Yeah, he and put we had a booth with us, so we yeah. had like both of our movie merch going on at the same time. So, like, we got to work <laughs> together someday. Yeah, we got to work together. And he said, "Yeah, I'm down." 
Yeah. Um, so, so it was, it was partly, you know, bringing in like friends and new friends and then bringing in Ginger and Drew being like, yeah, we, you know, we want to really work with them. People really like them. We like them. So let's uh, put this crazy Cabin in the Woods horror movie together yeah. and see if you guys all <laughs> want to stay together for three days in a cabin and see what happens. But everyone loved each other. We became a real family out there. Yeah, I can imagine being that secluded. So it's, and and I don't yeah. know, uh, you know, Ginger Lynn Allen personally, of course I know of her work, um, but I know Drew personally. And Drew's just, he's a great guy to work with. He's really funny. Um, he's very easy to work with. And, uh, you know, truth be told, I was incredibly intimidated with him, you know, when mm-hmm. I worked with him on, on Aximus. Really? As I thought, yeah, I'm like, you know, this is the guy who made Pool Party Massacre and he agreed to be in my film. And, and you know, I couldn't pay anybody because it was such a, you know, it was the film cost $500 to mm-hmm. make because, the you know, I worked at the storage facility. So I didn't, you know, I just had everybody show up there at, when we closed. And um, yeah, I mean, it was just, I'm sorry, not not on on, uh, on Exodus 2. He's on Exodus 2, not Exodus <laughs> 1. But it, that film cost $700. But um, yeah, I just I just figured this is the guy who, who made Pool Party Massacre, and you know they ended up being like a really nice guy, and I've worked with him, you know, yeah. a few more times, and we'll continue to work with him. But it's yeah, I just figured he was just one of these bucket list guys out here that I wanted to work with, and he agreed. So it's like, uh oh, now what do I do? <laughs> no, I got to make sure you. it's a good part. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've talked to him not that long ago, or we keep in touch every now and then, and. Uh, I told him I'm writing something for him in my next two scripts and, you know, um, something different, uh, something that they, he always plays like murderers and stuff like that. They right. <laughs> stuff, so that's his forte. But so I got a little something different for him. That I could yeah, he, he would probably appreciate that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, he, he plays... was great. Everyone loved working with him. Yeah, 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 I definitely do. So, yeah, because he's going to be in Axmas 3 and, and I have him, you know, lined up for a couple other things, so. And then I've worked on a couple of, of his things just as crew behind the scenes out here. So it's kind of a, you know, hey, you, you helped me and I'll help you and that type of thing. So um, so what was, um, like, how long did it take to kind of put everything together? Uh, pre-production, like put it together before we went out? Yeah. Yes, yeah, yeah, still pre-production, yeah. Yeah. Well, we did a promo shoot in August before we launched Indiegogo. And we had like all the, the, the main uh, female cast. Angie did a photo shoot with them to, to promote it. Um, and we used those photos, um, we print them out and we would put them inside the Blu-rays and stuff like that. Like the, the Blu-ray that, that you have with the photo of them in the bathroom and stuff, we're kind of going for a screen to mm-hmm. photo shoot um, thing. Uh, so we did that. Oh yeah, okay. uh, And then before that, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, they're all bloody and yeah, yes. exactly. Yeah, so those are the promotional photos that we shot before, I think two months before we started filming. Those yes. photos we used as part of uh, getting the hype for our Indiegogo. Yeah, just promo stuff. We shot that in August and then we started shooting in October. We were going to try and shoot in September, but just with scheduling issues, you know, people had things come up. Um, we couldn't get anything, everything together until October and we were kind of, you know, up against the, the wall there because up in Pinecrest, it starts getting really, really cold, like in November. In fact, the last day we shot there, uh, the next day it snowed. So it was getting really cold. So we were pushing it, um, but, you know, just because of people's schedules and things like that. And plus, you know, we spent the, those two months um, of prep time between August and October shopping. I felt like we were shopping every. Yay, we were like shopping to each like literally, like we would have to go to the mall, like, oh, God. I know. We would just look around and try to find clothes, you know, because well, we wanted to have every character have a distinct, unique look. Personality. Yeah. Well, there's so many characters. There's the, the female lead, and then there's the male roles, mm-hmm. and they have to have like their daytime outfits and then their nighttime right. stuff. And then, yeah, the girls had like three costume changes, and the guys had like two or something. Plus, we had to get all the props together, all the special effects together, and all the stuff as if you would go camping. So yeah. <laughs> making sure, just in case anybody forgot, because again, we're in Pinecrest, and it's quite a ways if you forget a toothbrush or something, mm-hmm. you're kind of yeah. out of luck. Yep. So I tried to be like a mom <laughs> and be like, okay, 
you know, we need extra towels, we need toilet paper, we need extra toothbrushes, we need like so, cleaning wipes, soap, shampoo, backup, everything in case anybody forgets anything, mm -hmm. we got it. Because right. we can't afford to take time to leave and go get something that mm -hmm. we forgot. Even for the actors themselves, we would prefer them not, if they did forget something, we wouldn't want them to leave because they were kind of short on right. time. So I try to bring everything in advance. So if anybody forgot anything, it was like, here's the stash. What do you need? I got <laughs> yeah. socks, I got sharpies, I have safety pins, like whatever you Different need. Different changes of clothes in case you need something, you know? Yeah. We, this was, we're shooting in a cabin. And it's the first time we ever shot on location for multiple days consecutively. We are super prepared. And the preparation process is something unlike we've ever experienced before. We've never done this much preparation. We've never had to. And it was just crazy. <laughs> like, it was so much. Like, it was a like, list on list on list. Oh, man. List. So many checklists just to make sure we had it. Because I've heard horror stories, you know, of people doing batteries. And I have more drives. drives. Like, it's a terrible whole thing of stories. And we did not want that to be us. So we were super, super prepared. And it did take a lot out of us doing this pre-production. Like I said, it was so much, everything. We tried to have everything, all of our bases. We wanted to have all the needs of the actors met too. So they were our number one priority yes. to make sure that they were comfortable, making sure they felt safe, they had what they needed, that mm -hmm. they felt well cared for, fed, that they, if they forgot anything, like, oh no, I forgot a towel. It's like, it's all right, I got extras. Right, that, yeah. Do whatever you need to do. <clears throat> Everything we, we, even that had a, need, we wanted to have available to them. We even made sure the batteries and all the smoke detectors were like we went and bought batteries just to make sure everything was up, up and up because we want no one going to sleep and being like, no, they're dead or something. That's what was floated around. So um yeah, we just really, really tried to prepare and it, it did take a toll on us prepared just because it was so, so, much, it's like two, so much work i think two months of pre-production because we were prepping the indigo like working the indigo yeah still doing that at the same time too as we were preparing to start going out to shoot because we were mm -hmm. going to make the movie whether we raised funds or not yeah, sure. so yeah. we were still planning everything at the same time as running the campaign and like responding to everybody's messages and thanking sharing the status yeah. thanking everybody Thank you, thank you, video. And we work full time that. jobs as well. So we're yeah. working full time, <laughs> doing the campaign, trying to prep for the movie. Yeah, I'm working at my computer and I'm making a thank you video over here for this guy. <laughs> so yeah, it was a lot of work. A lot of work. Yes, but it was it was great because everything worked out splendidly. Yeah. It still gives us anxiety. Like, oh yeah, looking I have back stress on it, sometimes. I have stuff that could have went. Other things that could have went wrong. Right, things that didn't. Go wrong. Things didn't go wrong. Thank God, everything like went really, really smoothly. <laughs> but thinking about what could have gone wrong still stresses yeah. us out. Oh yeah. I think the only thing that went wrong was I got sick. Yeah, uh -oh. Angie got sick. Yeah, the, like food so poisoning or took her out. No, I started feeling like. As we were driving up to the cabin, it was a Friday afternoon. Mm -hmm. uh, I started feeling like my throat feeling scratchy, and I just felt like a little like chilly, like chills. And I was like, "Oh, it's fine. It's probably just you know allergies or something." I'm notoriously prone to allergies, but um, I thought I'll sleep it off. No, mm -hmm. once I woke up, it was like death. I was yeah. so sick like <laughs> the whole weekend. I, I was, was so bad. I was so scared. I was like, "Oh my god, I have to do this all by myself." <laughs> All the girls are like, where are my clothes? Where is this? Where is that? I'm like, oh, shit. <laughs> and so, but luckily, she was sick, but she still came out of the room. She still helped. She still did what she had to do. And then she'd be like, okay, you good? I'm going to go back and lay down. And it's like, okay, thank I you. Ended, thank you yeah. so much. Like I guess that could have been bad. Yeah, yeah, you tried. I tried, but I ended you up were, going to really urgent care. Sick. Yeah. <laughs> Mom had to take her to urgent care like on the last day. It was so bad, yeah. It turns out well, I had tonsillitis. Tonsillitis? Oh, wow. Yeah. So then I was like quarantining myself because I was like, nobody come near me. We can't afford to get anybody sick. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, it's my stupid tonsils. It happens to me all the time. Well, so how, how long were you sick compared to the actual shoot schedule? I was sick the whole, the whole weekend that we shot like 90% oh. of the film. The three shot, days we were at the cabin. Yeah, we shot for three days at the cabin that's where we shot like 90 percent of the film in that three-day weekend and i was sick the entire time then we came back home we had a couple days off 
and then we shot again that weekend and I was just barely starting to like eat again and feel, mm-hmm. feel normal again. I was still sick, but we shot the following weekend. And then the weekend after that, we did something again. I can't remember what it was, but yeah. uh, it was the first three days. Finally, I was better by yeah. that point. Oh, it, was like man. The most- <laughs> it was pretty gnarly, but we made it. Everything we <laughs> planned. And that's why we planned so hard because if anything bad happened, like we mm-hmm. had to have a plan, the plan A, plan B, and Thank goodness we had everything laid out in advance so that when I did get sick, I could just say everything's in that pink tote. And what you're looking for is right here. And if you go over here, your thing's over there. And Paul knew exactly what to do, even though yeah. I was dying. And again, having uh, Angie's mom there to do the cooking and the food and take care of that was, like I said, another relief uh, weight off my, my shoulders too. So like, like I said, you know, I'm glad what we did, you know, all the hard work we put into it, but it was a lot. So, you know, like for anyone that wants to do that, you know, just got to be prepared. It's a I lot, know. A lot of work. The next day, I, my tonsils were so swollen, I could barely talk. And I was like, I can't do this. I, we just canceled. We just need to cancel. We'll, we'll reschedule. I was like, no. We worked so hard. <laughs> we worked so hard to get like 100 people. Not 100. That's exaggerating. Yeah. But so many <laughs> people's schedules to try to. It felt like 100 to cram them into these three days and all the prepping and everything. We're here. Like we just need to go. Push forward. Push forward. We gotta see this through yeah. and I will survive. It's fine. It's totally yeah. fine. But that's the importance of planning. Yeah. <laughs> but, I mean, prepared. Yeah, pushing forward for us, pushing forward is you know what we're here to do. And even our cinematographer Dan, he's on board to push forward. Our actors, we try to make sure they were not put out any like we were up late shooting but they weren't shooting 24 hours a day a lot of them were sleeping or they just wanted to watch so me her and dan were up late doing the movie and then whoever we're working with they had been resting for like six hours and then they come and shoot you know yeah. so we did not want to put our actors through any strain or stress but as far as that we go that's the way that's the game you know that's how it's got to be you know we got to be there first one on set and the last one to leave so yeah don't sit down (laughs) yeah that wow that's so that's amazing so you know i'm sorry you got sick that's that's awful i mean it's 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 almost like okay we're we're perfect we got this this is down a hundred percent there's going to be no problems and then womp 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 with the sickness of course course. i know everybody was doing videos and taking pictures and when we came home everyone was like that was the best weekend of my life it was so fun the experience was amazing and we should every- go back everyone's like in all these group photos and i'm like oh yeah I'm just, like, <laughs> but if one bad thing had to happen in that whole entire shoot because there's so many things that could have gone wrong like i said if i had to take the bullets that's okay that's a right. price i'm willing to pay for everything else to go exactly off. Yeah, our mission was yeah. to make sure everyone was taken care of. Like Drew and Ginger, make sure they got to their to the airport on time when they had to get their flight, and make sure everyone you know, was fed and taken care of. So. Yeah, yeah, because it, it kind of seems like if you have an actress or an actor who got sick, you know, or your DP or something, that that would have been really bad. But yeah, so I, I hate to say it, but yeah, probably out of all the people getting sick, you getting sick would have been the best person. Exactly. So I'm I'm sorry, but yeah, that's. Yep. Worst case scenario type of thing. <laughs> you gotta do what you gotta do. Exactly. Yeah. I'm glad it was me and not somebody else. Right. Yeah. Then because- yeah, they would really be like, we gotta come back some other time. Because all my work had already done been done on the front end, all right. the preparing and all the planning. So yeah, if I was there, I could have done more, or if I was healthy, I should say, I could have done more than what I did. But since everything was pretty much laid out, all it took was for Paul knew where everything was. He knew what everything had to what had to go next, and yeah. so again, thank goodness we were prepared. Yeah. That could have been enough. Yeah, it's all awesome. preparation. <laughs> Man, that's 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 tough, but great at the same time. So there you there you go. That's an inspirational story for any young filmmakers out there that are watching this. That even when you get sick, you gotta you gotta do it. You just have to you know continue forward. Yeah, independent I film, I mean, you really have to have a, a passion or um, like a certain kind of grit and determination to make sure 
that your film gets finished because there's so many things that could go wrong at this oh, yeah. level. It's very easy for people to just be like, oh, I can't this day after all. And you're like, what? I thought you <laughs> said you were free and you were down. And, and they're like, yeah, but I don't feel like it. And you're just like, no. Oh, <laughs> my gosh. A whole day I cancel. Now I got to reschedule. So it, it's very easy to get disheartened and just get kind of like, you know, bummed out about the, yeah. the challenges that constantly arise when you're working at this low, like independent level. Makes you want to quit. Exactly. So many people we know do quit because it is a pain in the ass, you know, like, oh, yeah, it's always going wrong or something. It's all these unforeseen things kind of pop up and it just makes it very easy to just be like, why do I even, why am I even doing this? Like, who cares? Why am I even trying at all? <laughs> but if you just like, Oh, like persevere and get through it everything is a learning experience and you're like okay so I learned so many things of what not to do this time next time I'm gonna do this and I mean we've been doing this for 10 years and we're still like after every film we're like okay this didn't work and next time we gotta do this <laughs> and yeah it's always a, it's a learning experience we're still finding yeah. fine-tuning our process even after all these movies and all these years it's just always something to improve so it's well yeah because yeah if you if you just quit you don't have this i mean that's that's the thing right. this just becomes a just an empty blue box you know this is <laughs> yeah. even with you being sick this is what came from it so you know, so what was the, you, you've kind of touched on it a little bit. What, what was like, um, what was post-production like? Um, well, after we shot everything in 2019, we had a few shoots in 2020, the beginning of 2020. And we had scheduled shoots with Ginger and Drew uh, in March of 2020. And then the <laughs> pandemic happened. Like so we put that on hold. The week we were supposed to finish. Yeah, again. had them booked already, booked hotel, booked flight. So that put a damper on things. We were supposed to release it in May of 2020. So a lot of 2020 was that get a little shot here, a little shot there. And then I was editing uh, throughout the whole um, throughout the whole winter. So before we were going to shoot with Ginger and Drew again in March, I edited a lot of it already. And I we'd even put together like a little promo trailer. We showed it to the cast. We had a little like cast um, after party, um, like in December or November. 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 So I was already working with a lot of the elements because we had so much of it. Like, yeah. like you said, we had like ninety percent of it basically. So I was editing. I love editing. You know, um, sometimes you know it can take a little long if uh, you know if something's not working or whatever. But um, I would edit every day. You know, in the morning I would get up early in the morning before I go to work. I did all weekend long, all Saturday and Sunday. Um, but for this movie, it was not too bad because we had so many elements to it, so many parts, so many scenes were, were constructed already. Um, so it was not too terrible. It was pretty pretty easy, especially compared to like Shoots of Vengeance where I had like a lot of shoots, a lot of footage. This one, we were pretty uh, economic with our shooting. And um like I said, we had a lot of it already, so it wasn't that hard at all. The, the hardest part was trying to get the uh, shoots that we needed done still while doing while editing. Uh, that was just the, the hard part, just waiting. Yeah. Are you a, a calm editor, or are you like kind of like a chaos? Like, like I'm a chaos editor. I love editing, but I look at all that footage and I'm like. No, no, it's not going to work. This film's garbage. It's horrible. I'm just going to throw it away and I'm not going to do it again. I quit. I'm, I'm going to go work in a pharmacy or something like that. <laughs> but as you slowly put it together, <laughs> <laughs> nothing um, bad about pharmacies. <laughs> no, <laughs> no, uh, I guess I would say calm because, um, like I said, I love editing. So when I'm seeing the footage, when I'm putting it together, you know, more or less, it's how I pictured it you know, how I want it to go. If there is something that's missing or, you know, oh shit, we didn't get that shot or we didn't get that angle or something, um, you know, then I'll try to just think of a solution, a creative solution around that. But most of the time it's pretty calm. Um, like I said, I just try to make sure I got it all lined up. Sometimes I'll go too long on a scene and I'll, you know, I have to just make it long and then just go back and cut it again to make it shorter or make it make the rhythm, you know, because the rhythm is not there yet. It's all just kind of putting shots together and angles together. Sometimes, I mean, every now and then I'll get a little 
neurotic about, oh, well, don't want this angle, don't want that angle. But it's like <laughs> I've learned to, to get rid of that is to not shoot so much coverage. Yeah. And that's something that saved us time a lot because I had the cinematographer shoot and be like, oh, do you want to get her reversal? And I'll know no. I don't want it because I'm <laughs> never going to come back to her. I'm going to keep it on this person or maybe even this person. Yeah. So knowing that beforehand alleviates a lot of wasted time on set and also alleviates editing anxieties on how do I cut this? Because I've already figured out how I want the scene to look before I shot it. And it gets pretty damn close. So. I think that's again, tied into the, the pre-planning, the pre-production of like knowing when we're writing the script, there's so many notes on the side of like what angle and how we want it shot so that when the time comes, we're like you said, we're not wasting too much time shooting it from every yeah. angle and up and try down to, and reverse and try to really pare down the coverage. Then you're just uh, so you're you're gonna be the one that has to watch all that crap when you go back <laughs> right. and try to upload all that footage. It's like you don't want to spend all your time watching a thousand hours of footage only to make a seventy minute movie. So right, so I've gotten really good at writing to. The vision that he's already seeing so that he only shoots exactly what he's imagining so that we're not wasting like you said extra time shooting things that are unnecessary and then once yeah, the things editing, you know you're just not going to use yeah so once the editing time comes there's not a ton of extra stuff that we know we're not going to use yeah but we had, yeah that's the good thing about the 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 writer director also being the editor because as you're writing it you can say you know, Bridget says, don't come in here. Oh, that's a close up. Bob says, you know, um, I'm right outside the door. Oh, this is going to be a medium shot. You could just go through that in your head and then just make notes or whatever it is. Or when you finally finish the script, you can always go back and make notes or have your shot list or whatever. And um, yeah. so that's always useful if you're, you know, somebody who does multiple things like, you know, writer, yeah. director, editor. Exactly. So, I should ask, add also that uh, this film was the first time that we had um, some rehearsals in advance. A lot of times we don't have the luxury of people having a free schedule oh, to do that's some good. rehearsing. Yeah. But with this one, we really encouraged the actors to memorize because we were going to be in that cabin for three days only. And we were going to try and get everything. Yeah, so that helped a lot that we, the actors all knew their lines. We really encouraged it's just something that doesn't always happen. Exactly. <laughs> so, that's why it's a feature. So we really encourage, strongly encourage them to have as much possible memorized. And then we did a, a lot of rehearsals as much as we could in advance so that they could get those kind of like kinks worked out when they had questions about like, well, how am I saying this? Am I surprised or am I mad? Or yeah. so we right. can get all those questions answered right. in advance so that again, once we got to the set, it was everybody already knew the tone of the dialogue, yeah. where, how they were supposed to react, who they were supposed to look at when they, you know, said whatever. Yeah. So that, all that preparation, again, saved us time on set. So everybody knew what was going to go down. Yeah. It saved us from having to take, take two, take three, take four because of mistakes. A lot of that got eliminated. So mm -hmm. we try not to shoot take after take after take. We try to do, give them time to do rehearsals in advance. Then when we're on set, we try to let them run through it, get comfortable. And when we, we ask them, like, okay, do you guys feel ready to ready to shoot one? Yes. Yeah. Then we'll shoot. We try not to waste time filming stuff when they're not even ready to. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, only had to make a few adjustments here and there. They, they, they did really well in learning their lines. And they, they knew how important it was, how time was of the essence. Yeah. And we were really lucky that this group, um, they really wanted to do their best. So it was important to them. And most of them memorized most of the dialogue. There's a lot there, but they all, I have to give so much credit to them. They all did such an amazing job at being prepared, yeah. have, bringing their script, knowing what their character was about. Mm -hmm. And uh, they really wanted to, to do a great job. So yeah. we were really lucky there. It hasn't always been that way. Oh, that's, <laughs> yeah, that, that's great. Yeah, that you had all of that, uh, that time to do that you know with the rehearsing and all that stuff so because it, it's it's tough um that especially if you have long you know dialogue scenes and these kind of long tarantino monologues that you know if they don't have the time to memorize those you're going to be there all day just for that one line you know then it's like okay we'll just yeah. cut half of that out and it just you know <laughs> yeah, yeah. Exactly. Then, exactly. then your all beautiful right. tarantino scene is gone but at least you got the line so <laughs> <laughs> genius writing. 
<laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> and um, now with the actors, <coughs> excuse me, um, what I noticed, because you, you mentioned that you got like all the costumes and everything like that for them. One thing I did appreciate is all the women look different. So there was no confusion yeah. of who got killed here or who walked into the, you know, into the woods here. They all had their own personalities. They all had their, and the men too, the men all looked different. Yeah. And, and so it was nice that you didn't have two people who looked identical. And, and of course the one actor for me who stood out was, was oh. the groom oh. who I wanted to kill. And, and um, I'm just like, yeah. just, just, just throw him yeah. to the wolves. Oh. If, if any are out there, this, man with his napoleon complex that's that's such a horrible human being <laughs> but it, it was um but so tell, actually tell me about him what why was he such and he's short too so i don't know was he crouching down or did he just happen to be short what uh what's what's with him he's talking about the short. dream so, <laughs> first of all i have to say i appreciate you so much commenting on the fact that they all look different yeah. because oh, sure. that was intentional <laughs> And For it's sure. very easily overlooked. A lot of people don't really notice that. So I really appreciate you commenting on oh, that. Oh, you're welcome. It sure. Was and I really wanted them to each have their own style, their own voice, their own attitude. So that was definitely right. their own color too. Like right. Their own wear. colors. So it was definitely planned, um, even with the guys. So yeah. I even did all the wardrobe for the guys as well. So we wanted them to have their own unique voices. Uh, Andrew Brown, he's the guy who plays the, the groom, Dolph, and everybody hates his guts. So <laughs> <laughs> you're right on. On screen, off screen, no. everywhere, <laughs> every screen. So he loves to give him a hard time because he's such a nice person in real life. That's what's so crazy. Yeah, yeah, he's a nice in guy. Life, but he does like to talk so shit. Sweet. He does like to tease. And so that's why everyone would always tease him and talk shit to him because he, he likes to tease. So that <laughs> aspect of his character, he really liked playing into that. Oh, yeah. He loved fun. playing into being like the total dude. Yeah. So um, <laughs> that's a testament to his acting abilities. We've seen him. Um, he does a lot of theater mm -hmm. here in town. And uh, he's actually right after we finished filming Flash Light Party, he moved back. To, he moved to Los Angeles to pursue an acting career. So oh, this nice. is something that's really important to him. And um the fact that everybody hates his gut so much is just a testament <laughs> to like how good of an actor he is because he really pulls off a big time yeah. asshole so right he does he does a great job being an asshole um <laughs> they will too do a job uh some people out there you know go easy on him because it is messing with his mental health a little bit no he, the, he's getting death threats he's he's getting, <laughs> yes he is people are like i want to kill that guy i'm like chill <laughs> this is the character no, yeah <laughs> Everyone, you know, leave Andrew alone. He's our friend. We love him. We don't want any harm. You know, his character. If he's, you want to kill his character, that's fine. Yeah, he's acting. He's acting, guys. But he's a great actor. He's a good actor. He was a great asshole. In this movie. Right, a lot. Of, that sentiment has been expressed. Many, he really many times. bought it. Boy, and I, I, I'm. It's funny how many people are like, "Oh, I can't wait to see that guy killed." And <laughs> yeah, it's happening, right. And I, and I thought, like, am I making a mistake? Because that was always the plan. Obviously, it's in the script that he survives. But I thought, oh, maybe I'm making a mistake. But I'm not giving the audience what they want. I want to see him dead. I was like, well, yeah. it's creating expectations. You know, it's an expectation that he's going to be killed. Obviously. So I was like, okay, let me hold back. You know, let me let me let me try something different here. So I you, you know, turned it, you you, you flipped it. Yeah. yeah, you flipped it. Yeah, we tried to <laughs> so. do a couple of things that were not predictable because yeah. there's a lot of things that are predictable because it's yeah. it's, a, it's an homage yeah. to an '80s slasher. So a lot of stuff you're like, oh, they're gonna get slashed. Right. But we wanted to throw in a couple of things that were like, what? Yeah. He doesn't die. Right. Or yeah, what? Well. Surprised. Yeah, yeah. Guys, I, I was going to avoid that. I didn't want to do spoilers, but uh, yeah, I was, I was, uh, I'm just like, what, why, why yeah, didn't he, he you know, and it's, it's <laughs> kind of like in, in Friday the 13th, the remake, the guy with the curly hair, that's a total jerk. And at the end, you know, Jason mm -hmm. throws him on the, you know, on the tow truck. And, and I always thought the backs of right. tow trucks look like crosses. And so he oh, kind of yeah. lands like this. And I'm just like, the, the biggest a-hole in the movie is being crucified like Jesus. You know, what's going on here? But at least he's dead, you know? So, wow. and, and so, yeah, I kept hoping, when is this guy going to die? Because there is a mm -hmm. shot that if you blink, you might miss it where 
he's on the ground and he's kind of dead and he looks up quickly, kind of looks around and then goes back like this to pretend <laughs> to be dead. And yeah. I'm like, what an asshole. He's just playing dead. <laughs> yes. Yeah, I think yes. I want to say, uh, I remember I, I, I was doing something. I had Dan and, and Andrew shoot that little insert shot and I was doing something like trying to get Ginger ready for our next shot. And I told me, oh, just shoot him, you know, on the ground, like, ah, oh, oh. And I'm like, you know, looking, and then he came up with the idea of doing the, you know, the little <laughs> take that he does, and then puts his head back down. I'm like, oh, that's that's wonderful, beautiful. I love it. Just what Howard would do. Yeah, yeah, Perfect. yeah. It, so it's it's props to Andrew. Yeah, I, I've said uh, um, in multiple movies. I mean, I've always said that play dead, just play dead. You know, Jason yeah. will walk right past you, or Michael will walk right past you. You know, they, they know they're technically dumb. You know, it just you know they'll just go. They won't know. And you finally did it. So, so thank both of you for that. <laughs> you finally did what I've suggested for 20 it. years. <laughs> yeah, exactly. He let his woman try to deal with a murderer. <laughs> yeah. Well, she ended up being nutty too. Right. I mean, she, she went from just a, a tad yeah. bit nutty to going Jack Nicholson, you know, uh, shining nutty. So. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> a lot of twists. Yeah. A lot of twists. <laughs> it's a twist. It's an M. Night twist. Um. <laughs> And then one thing I noticed, just because I know uh, Ginger Lynn, well, you know, like I said, not professionally, but I know her work, is the 1980s music video that's playing in the office of the the person yes. who's sending out the strippers. Uh, yep. what, what was yes. that all about? <laughs> I'm so glad you noticed that. We slipped, slipped that in there and we'll, you know. I had found it's that pretty funny. LP, yeah. I had found that her LP, or not LP, her single, a uh, vinyl single of a song she made only song at a record store one day and uh this is before we used her in streets of vengeance and i found it i was like oh this looks pretty cool i don't know what it is and ginger lynn I'm like, oh, this thing sounds familiar and then when we started <laughs> making streets of vengeance and the new wave hookers kind of a uh, aesthetic like oh that's ginger oh that's the same person i was like wait a minute <laughs> like, you made a song you know and then then we worked with her and then i showed her the record and she's like, oh my God, I haven't seen this in a long time. And she signed it for us and stuff. And she told <laughs> how, she, how she recorded it and everything. And I wanted to use it in Streets of Vengeance, but um, I didn't. And I don't know why, I just, just didn't. I really wanted to. So I was like, well, I didn't get to use it in the last movie, so let me use it in this movie. And then there's a music video, master permission to use it. She's like, yeah, of course. And so now it's on, uh, on the TV <laughs> screen. And so the song's in there a little bit, which I'm really happy about. It's an awesome song. And the music <laughs> video is even better. So that was a little homage to our friend Ginger, because we love her so much. Oh, it, it's that video is very 80s. So it's, it's, yes. it's, it's yeah, because that's... <clears throat> Girls pretending to play the drums or pretending to play the keyboard and the guitar. <laughs> Just hey, obviously, yeah. <laughs> but like those cat so videos of, of the cat playing the piano. Yeah. <laughs> it's so it's so great. Yeah. If anyone out there wants to see it, it's Fantasy World is the, the name of the song and name of the movie that the, the music video comes from. Yeah. It's amazing. We have to slip that in there somewhere. Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm glad you did. Thank you. So that was, I'm, I'm, I'm just like, ah, yeah. I'm like, ah. Yeah, I don't think anyone else has ever brought yeah. that up before. You don't want to brought it up. Yeah, no one else has commented on that either. Oh, yeah. nice. Good. Yeah. Well, thank you. I yeah. look for details. I always look for tiny details. Yeah, so to me that, because you're, you're, as a filmmaker, you have to have details. Like, does the person have a wedding ring? Uh, what type of coffee mug uh, are they using? I, I even pointed that out in one of the other interviews is that I said, oh, oh, no, no, no. It was a, um, it was a card, like a welcome card to a job. Uh, and um, I'm like, well, who picked out that card? Because the card has ties on it. And that card would be perfect for like a business to say welcome on board. And, and I look for that stuff because it could have been anything. It could have just been a tree. It could have been, you, you know, a, a giraffe on there or something that just says welcome or, or something. But no, somebody found the card that has business ties to welcome them to a job. And it's like, these wow. are important little things that that as a director or producer or, or a, you know, a set designer or anything that they need to have, does this character have a mug that says best boss on it, you know, mm -hmm. sitting on their desk? And right. it's just, it's important. And, and people should notice these things. So right. um, I, I, I uh, especially oh, because uh, 
at, at an independent level, like I really appreciate you noticing that because when you're this independent, low budget, it's easy for people to just like skate over that oh, stuff. I don't have time like, for that. I don't have the time. We don't have the budget. We don't have the whatever experience or whatever to think about those details. But mm-hmm. it's nice to see you actually like notice that stuff, <laughs> care about those details. Because well, I do. Yeah, that's a big do. part of our our work, our process. And we really try to pay attention to those kind of details too. I appreciate you noticing. That. Oh, you're welcome, that, and, and and I love finding them. So, that. yeah, and it's for a moment there. I almost thought is the you know is like the 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 psychiatrist and and the singer on the video are they the same people like in a past like when she was in her 20s was she making mm-hmm. 80s music videos and then oh, went to college and then became this doctor that's now teaching people mm-hmm. and so i was like All okay right. is is the stripper the guy going to go into the house and be like hey i recognize you you're on that <laughs> video and they were being like oh huh? what are you talking about that's a past life get away from me and that's uh-huh. going to be... <laughs> I mean, that I guess, yeah. good. Oh, my gosh. That'll you could awesome. link, you could, if you know who Ginger Lynn is, you could link the two together. So, uh, um, yeah. but that was good. Yeah, Dr. Petra, you're Ginger Lynn. <laughs> yeah, who are you? Yeah, you know, hey, you, you're fake. You're fake. You're a fake doctor. <laughs> we should have done that. We should have done that. <laughs> <laughs> Ginger Lynn playing herself. And the, uh, the bride, I noticed, is a, is a cutter, but she uses a stick. So uh, um, why a stick? Why not have her like find uh, like a piece of glass or something? What what was the idea with the stick? Uh, the stick, I wanted to be something that she could, you know, I'm sorry, it sounds graphic, but insert inside of her. Um, so I had Uh-oh. a piece of glass. Um, so that's basically what she does. I mean, it, we allude to it. I mean, she just sticks it underneath her, her dress and then she says, oh, I killed it. And then she has blood all over her legs. And things like that. So that's why we use the stick. It's kind of oh, like I got you. Yeah, okay. it's kind of suggesting got that she was pregnant, but she was, even though she wasn't. So it's right. kind of suggesting that, and that's kind of why we did the stick. I don't know. That all came out of his brain. <laughs> yeah, I, thought I, I was going for something. Yeah, he's okay. going for something. Okay, yeah, because I saw like there was blood on her arms and on her legs, and, and she kind of took the stick over her arms and stuff. So I guess that she was just rubbing the blood off on her arms. And I'm like, oh man, she's digging really deep in there to get that blood out of her arms with that stick. You know, granted it's like a branch, but it's just like you know, like wow. Okay, oh, but yeah. what, but what she's actually doing is much worse. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> so you 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 kind of had your Sam Raimi Evil Dead moment with the vines. Yeah, yeah, branches. Yeah, yeah. It it should be something that was out there that she could just find. You know. (laughs) I'm guessing both of you were not in agreement on this, from what I'm seeing. (laughs) I'm just, I'm just like, sure, sure. Yeah, yeah. 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 Disagreement. She was just like, oh, yeah, yeah, I guess. Sure, he's crazy. But if you're doing like a Q and A at at a screening, do you point? You know, do you point over to? His idea. His idea. Sometimes. Some yeah. of the stuff I'm like, I don't know. I think it's true. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> some of the stuff like I'll I can uh, identify which ideas were mine and then I can identify which ones were Paul's. Um it's interesting to see people guess, but uh, that was his that was out of his brain. The good ones are <laughs> the good ones. <laughs> he says with a straight okay. face. The good and ones. The yeah. <laughs> you saved you no, saved yourself right on that one. Yeah. Yeah, I'm right in the <laughs> and we're talking about the special effects. What, were they uh, any visual effects done, or was it all practical? It was all practical. practical. Um, actually, we had to, like I said, we had to do it ourselves because we had tried to get a, um, an artist to do it, but uh, they flaked out at the last minute. So I had to learn how to, um, actually I went to YouTube and I, um, the scene where the girl gets the machete through her chest or the back and stick out of her chest. Uh, we use what I call a blood cannon. I had to get a fire a water extinguisher and an air compressor, fill it with blood, pump it up. And then we yeah, just put it to us do, uh, practicing in my backyard and I uh, sprayed the fence with we had blood. A new- Fence and spots in our backyard. <laughs> and I'll freeze it with oh. blood. <laughs> Guess what? Came out eventually. 
So, <laughs> yeah. It's all for Brand. art. It looked like somebody got slaughtered. It was a lot <laughs> random. It looked like yeah, somebody yeah, got yeah, slaughtered season, in our backyard. So. Yeah, I looked pretty gnarly for a while. But it worked. You know, I was like, oh my God, this is going to work. So, this copious amounts of blood just spurred out of her chest. So, that was something that we had to do. Um, yeah, the Gore Lords, just... like I said, they helped us a lot when they did the, the axe wound. They did, um, they applied the scab uh, to the girl's stomach. They get stabbed in the shower. Oh, I, I made the guts that are in the movie for the first time ever making guts, and they turned out pretty good. I thought yeah. a lot of people really liked the guts. They looked so real. I came home and they were like all over my kitchen. I was like, <laughs> what the hell is that? Oh my yeah. god, there's like guts everywhere. It's because like you know you just use like saran wrap and you use star wax tissue and some cotton balls That's and just so spray some blood. It doesn't look like much, but then when you roll it up into like a sausage kind of thing, <laughs> oh, it looks pretty damn good. It's and then it so the Gore Lords put like blood on top of it and made it look gooey and sticky and stuff. So it made it look even better. So that was really cool. You know, like yeah. I did one part and then they did the, the other part because I couldn't do it by myself. I'm so glad either. they were there. So yeah, thank you to Devin and Jasmine. Yeah, Devin and Jasmine, they are podcasters turned actors. Gore Lords, check them out. Gore Lords podcast. They uh, were just supposed to be acting, but, and I was going to do all the, the special effects since our effects guy dropped out last right. minute. Um, I took all the stuff, so all the um, liquid latex and star wax or star gel or whatever. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that, blood gel. All that stuff, all the Gallons brushes. Of blood. Yeah, all the fake blood and all that stuff. So I had all the things there and ready to go. So I was going to do it. And then I, came out crawled out from my room <laughs> feeling like death to try to apply uh, some of the stuff and Devin and Jasmine were like oh we actually have experience with this because um they helped Response. yeah they they would set up like I think Devin's parents would yeah. do like a haunted, haunted house, house kind of thing kind of like thing. a haunt and so they used to get all into the effects and stuff and so he's like I actually have experience with, experience with this do you guys you want to help? I was like, yes, please. So, Thank yeah, God. I gave him all the stuff. And here's a syringe here, for the blood. Here's, here's, a, the here's a tube. Put this in Shailene's head and hide it so we can pump the blood out. And, you know, they, they did it. Yeah, so they thankfully they were there and they were able to apply all of the special effects, all the little pieces that looked like open wounds and, mm-hmm. and blood and stuff for that main weekend. And then a lot of the other stuff I did. So, like, when the guy gets stabbed through the head, and the knife comes out through his chin. Mm-hmm. Um, I, did <laughs> I did that. I like duct tape a piece of cardboard with that. <laughs> yeah, the, the, we cut a knife in half uh. and put it underneath his chin. Uh-huh. Yes, and then uh, Katie, when she gets the machete through her chest, we made that too, like out of a cardboard and a belt. Yeah, just and it had put it underneath their shirt and you know, just tightened it so it would hold it in place. And then I did the, the cannon so it blew out uh, all the blood and everything. So yeah. that, was, that was fun. And you did the tube for when the girl gets the axe and the blood just like goes. Yeah, Jasmine and Devin did that. For Shailene. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so yeah, so it was a yeah, it was us us four, basically us two and Devin and Jasmine doing the, the effects. Yeah. That's wow. nice to, to see no no visual effects, that it's all right. practical. Yeah, so. we tried to do all practical. <clears throat> yeah, we're not really big fans of visual, like the CGI kind of stuff because well, one, we don't want to do it. Yeah, I don't know how to do it. And two, <laughs> we don't really care for how it looks either. So we just the, there's packages that you could get. I mean, there's enough of them on YouTube that you could download. You know, just like green screen mm-hmm. blood splattering. Uh, um, I tend to oh, like yeah. both. Yeah. I, I I like physical effects better, but I have seen enough films now to where it's almost a. It almost makes the film look like a comic book. And it kind of depends yeah. on what the film is. Some cases it works, in some cases yeah. it doesn't. Right. But it depends on how it's done. That you know that I yeah. I prefer practical, but you know sometimes you got to do visual. You know, like yeah, fire. Jam but, <coughs> also, yeah. because it was uh, '80s inspired, uh, we wanted to kind of keep that vibe by doing practical effects because it kind of makes it continue with the theme of like feeling like an 80s yeah, film would do school. like practical effects. Mm-hmm. Why why do you think so many people like the 80s as far as it comes to slasher films? Why not the 90s? Um, Ooh, that's a good question. Yeah, because I mean the 90s, like I love 90s movies and I'm kind of using the 90s for my next script. As far as slashers go, I mean, 
it's just, I think it's just a numbers game. There's just so many in the 80s and so many good ones. In the 90s, there are a few good ones, but not a lot. I mean, a lot of the slasher movies in the 90s were like PG-13. You know, yeah, a lot yeah of there were a lot of those. There, you know, so they were losing a lot of their edge. Uh, the 80s were just way more gruesome, way more bloody. You know, they didn't give... It wasn't as um, mainstream, so you can get away with a lot of uh, hardcore violence. And then in the 90s, you know, you had like, you know, Jennifer Love Hewitt and Freddie Prinze Jr. and, you know, Nev Campbell and stuff. You had all these like TV stars and like, it was, like more about beautiful the actors, people. Not yeah. About the, like, yeah, definitely. Like, and so you had stars and teen stars at that in the 90s slasher movies. So they just, they just don't have the same impact on it. I mean, me personally, I don't see that. Maybe also, even Halloween four. I mean, it's, mm-hmm. Also, I'm just like talking out of the air, so maybe I'm wrong. But it also kind of seems like from the '80s that each killer was so unique in having their own persona that was so distinct that you would recognize them anywhere, and they were cooler than anyone else in the movie. So it oh, didn't matter, right? Like, Right. Jennifer Love Hewitt's in the movie. We don't care about her. We want to see Freddie. Right. We yeah. want to see Jason. Yeah, but or... I don't. I don't care about the fisherman guy. And I know what about... you did last summer. I don't, I don't. I don't really care about Ghostface. Nobody cares about the from Scream. Yeah. In the 80s. I really don't. What? I don't. Uh, Ghost. The uh, Ghostface killer from Scream, like Stu and um, Ski Ulrich's uh... character. Uh, they don't really do it for me. I mean, they're they're funny, but they're not Michael Myers. They're not Jason. <laughs> I mean. <yeah. clears throat> A bunch of dumbasses who stab each other so they can make it look like you know the cops. It was just not the same. It was not the same. Stu. I'm still still name. Little Skill Rick's name was character. Stu's in part five. (laughs) Oh god. I love the actor, but Stu, I don't really care for. He's fine. Wow. Yeah, because it's. Well, if if I've used these films um, as an example before, prom night. If even though there's only technically really one prom night movie because the killer does die at the end and the rest of them are just, you know, Mary Lou type of uh, mm-hmm. was a Mary. Hello, Mary Lou prom night, two, And then it just continues on. Yes, but yeah. the first prom night, if you put up a picture of that killer with the stalking and the axe, even though he was only in one movie, you would go. That's prom night. Yeah. But if you showed a picture of the killer from the remake of prom night, you'd be like, what is this? I have no idea what this movie's from, I, I, or what this picture is from. <clears throat> you know this. I've seen the remake, so it, it, don't bother. <clears throat> it's it's bad. <laughs> it it yeah. is absolutely Which... horrible. I I will almost because I'm a completist. I will pretty much buy everything in the series, even if I don't like it. Prom Night I bought, mm-hmm. and then I just ended up selling it. It's just like no, this is not <laughs> going with the rest of the Prom Night movies. I'm sorry, it's just too <laughs> horrible. Right. Yeah, it's just yeah. it's just not good. And, and there's also, I mean, because you guys, even the music, you know, in this is very 80s inspired. Do you have any people that you like that have done like 80s type music? Like any composers? Uh, other than the people we've worked with? Yeah, just like, like anybody I, that's like John Carpenter, for example. Yeah, or... John Carpenter, he's a very, very huge influence. He's a big influence on the composers that work with us. Like, for instance, uh, Vestron Vulture, uh, he loves John Carpenter. Uh, I discovered him on Bandcamp because he was making albums that were John Carpenter-esque, Giorgio Moroder. Uh, he was very, very into the 80s. Oh, yeah, that. very good. Uh, yeah. Uh, uh, even Goblin, too. To Goblin's extent. great. So he uh, was definitely influenced by them. I loved it. And I said, I need this sound. And he's been with us since Cinco de Mayo. And for Slash Rap Party, um, we also brought in the Grind Theory. Um, he's, he's in New York. And he's um, a great musician too. He's not so much into, I don't know if he's into John Carpenter so much, but he is into like new wave music. Oh, and uh, yeah, and his music is great. We use one track of his in uh, Streets of Vengeance. And then in this one, he had like four uh, tracks in this movie. And so he's, he's amazing too. So I was like, well, why not have two great composers in this movie? So right now, sure. the, soundtrack for best song vulture is out on itunes and spotify you can check it out and i believe the grind theory he's going to be putting out the tracks he did for slasher party as its own separate album yeah. as well oh okay we guys. <clears throat> and uh, we've been working with them for a few projects now yeah. and even though we have yet to meet in person 
Um, because Monte or Festron Vulture, he's in Mexico. He's from Mexico and uh Brian Theory is in New York. So we haven't had a chance to meet in person, right. but we've had a working relationship for a few years now. So that's so amazing. The internet is yeah. uh, oh it's <laughs> yeah, I I with with all the bad it does, it oh excuse me, it does even more good. I mean, you <laughs> could you, you know, if, if you said, hey, John, shoot me uh, this one minute scene for something, I could go out and shoot it in Vegas and then just right. email it to you. And boom, right. it's done. You, you know, right. you don't have to worry about anything. I mean, right. how could they make right. movies yeah, back you, then you without the Internet? You know. Right. I know. And yeah. now we've been able to connect with other filmmakers that are on the same like our level. It's so it's hard enough. Like we're from our, our city's not that big. So. The odds of us finding other filmmakers is not too high yeah. in our area. So being able to be exposed to other filmmakers that are on our same level or yeah. have our same kind of like outlook or goals or whatever, it's so amazing to be able to connect with our community online yeah. to share um, experiences or tips or recommendations. Or like just or, promote each other's movies. Now, yeah. I'm always there. Sure. You know, yeah. I always promote, you know, Sean Donahue, uh, Christopher Bickle. Drew Marvick, of course, he's the homie. Uh, you now uh, Shane Hirschberger, you know, he did um, his uh, campaign for Treaters recently, uh, contributed that, bought his last movie, Force the Fear. And he's a cool guy. Him and uh, John Hale, you know, his cinematographer, like we, we did a podcast for, for, you know, for their podcast, City of Infestation. And, uh, you know, had a great time just talking to them about dead dudes in the house, you know, <laughs> stuff like that. So to be able to talk to people with our shared interests, you know, is through the internet. And so like, like I said, if uh, someone can help out, say, hey, can you give me a B-roll footage of this or that? You know, we can shoot it, we transfer it to you, you I mean, hours. There's a filmmaker in Virginia right, right now that's using two of the actors from Slash the Web Party in their, actually three, right? I believe so. Uh, from Slash the Web Party in their movie. And the actors are from here. Right. So, <laughs> And he saw them in the slash web party. Slash web party and now cast of them for a movie that's being shot back east. So yeah. it's crazy how you can, we can put each other on to. Yeah, I'll be part oh, of the yeah. <clears throat> yeah, and, and, and I haven't come across anybody who's against it. You, you know, it doesn't. <clears throat> I have a friend named uh, uh, John R. Walker, and he lives in the UK. And um, he did like Amityville Theater um he did like uh he did a, a ouija geist and he did some other stuff too and we're good friends he always plays like the news reporter in in my films and he he records oh, it over in the uk and he has the whole studio set up and then um one day he asked me he goes hey i want to have a i'm shooting a movie out here but i want to have a scene that takes place in vegas can you go out and shoot me this scene and also just get me yeah like b-roll footage of vegas and we did. We assembled yeah. a little crew. We went out. We shot the scene. And then like a few days later, I just drove down the strip and just had the camera sitting on my dashboard. And I just drove from one end to the next, wrapped around. I did it twice, I think. And, and he had footage of Vegas. And, awesome. and awesome. so now he has a scene that takes place in Vegas with footage from Vegas. And it's not green screened. It's not stock footage. It's yeah, you know, and, and it's fun. that easy. You know, it's just returning a favor, basically. You know, and also now you're his American second unit. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> I am now in a in a UK movie. So, yeah. um, and um, oh, one thing I did forget to bring up, as far as like story goes on this, um, I looked over this. I liked how, and maybe this is intentional. Maybe it's not. The cell phones worked. Most films, somebody's always holding up the phone, going. I'm not getting a reception here. It's dead. My phone's right. dead. Yours, they worked. Was right. that intentional? <laughs> yeah, I didn't want to make the cell phone not working a plot point, you know, necessarily. It's just that everyone's having a good time and they don't have their phones on them. And then they get ambushed and no one runs for their phone. They're too busy running for their lives. You know, they're in like their pajamas and nighties and stuff. So they don't really have a place to put it really. But yeah, I never wanted to make the cell phone like, oh, it's dead, all right, no signal out here or whatever. Um, that didn't really interest me really too much, you know? Yeah, we figured they got caught off guard. So mm -hmm. they're all in the same room together. Yeah. No one's running. Well, yeah, especially if they're in, yeah, like 90s and stuff. Yeah, the phones would just be 
in their rooms somewhere, you know? Right. So that's, so yeah. So, so yeah, it's, it's a, uh, it's something that I liked. Yeah. It's a compliment that the phones worked because it's one of those rare movies yeah. where somebody's actually having a working cell phone. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Yeah. It's kind of, yeah. There's a cliche, like you said, where like, oh, phone doesn't work. Our phones work up there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I, I had in um, in the first Axmas film, um, Ashley, who plays Sarah, I didn't notice it, but she had throughout the shoot a red cell phone sticking out of her back pocket that if your eye will just go straight to it because it's red. And a couple of people said, she has a cell phone. Why didn't she just call people? And I'm like, uh, mm -hmm. um, uh, uh, cell phones don't really work at storage facilities. That was yeah. my excuse because <laughs> it was my mistake. It was a continuity error. That I should, and so on part two, I said, remove cell phones. We do not have cell phones in this movie. They don't exist. So we wouldn't have to go through that again. But it, it's just yeah. like, fuck, yeah, I forgot to tell her to take <laughs> out that phone. And then from, from some time to time, it moves from pocket to pocket. Because you know? <laughs> in between takes, what you take it out, you know, and, <laughs> and start texting yeah. and stuff. And then we go into the right pocket the next time we go in the left pocket. So it happens. Yeah. Yeah, so like, hey, if we're shooting, put your cell phone away. It's not on your person. It's not on the character unless you're actually using it to talk. Then you'll... Right. So you, you could go the route that you did, which is just phones work. People have them, but they're running around and it's all chaos. So they're not thinking about it. Or cell phones, hey, it's not working. Or mm -hmm. um, just cell phones don't exist. Right. Right. You know, those kind of seem to be the three ways of doing it. So. But I, yeah, I think I like your way best. I think I do because cell phones do exist. Thank you. Yeah. Um, yeah. So they did uh, work and exist, but in real life, for the actors, of course, well, there's the the rule of uh, cell phones off and away. So <laughs> you can't have them in your pockets. Can't have them around. Um, and actually, I have to credit Dan, our cinematographer, is really good at reminding everybody because I mean he's shooting the, um. the footage here, so. The last thing you want is to spend all that time like it's setting so up your shot and everything's going perfectly and then a phone goes off. So yeah. he's very good at reminding everybody like phones off. Right. <laughs> so That's good. That. Yeah. Yeah. So now the distribution of Slasherette Party, um, this mm -hmm. was uh, distributed by, by, you, by you guys? Yeah, we went through Kanaki. Uh, to manufacture the Blu-rays and the DVDs. Yeah, this is the first time us using them. Uh, we did have offers for a slash art party um, before it was done and then after it was done. And in talking to people, you know, because we had I had sort of distribution deal for Streets of Vengeance and Secret of Mile. And then the distribution deals that we received for slash art party were either more the same or not as good as it was before. So we didn't think it made sense to step backwards uh, in any in any aspect, whether it was you know reach like you know their their reach like their global reach or even in money, you know. So like the deal just didn't make sense for us. So we're like, sure. why would I accept twenty percent and you take eighty percent after you recoup five thousand dollars? And it's like, well, why would I do that? And if I should just do it myself? Yeah, and it's like, and if their reach is just as wide as ours, or less. even less, and then in most cases, then why not just do it ourselves? It just means more work, right? If we're, I can find someone to manufacture, we're not afraid of hard work. No, so. obviously, and we're cheap as hell. So, <laughs> <laughs> so we're like, so what? What do, what do we got to do? What does it take? You yeah, what does it take? What do we got to do? Just print out some. Yeah, so I just covers. wanted. To yeah, like, you know, orders and stuff. How expensive is it? How hard is it? And you know, I did have to do some tests with the Blu-ray. Like I had to do like five tests because it just didn't come out right. Um, we also did VHS tapes, and I looked up how to make my own VHS tapes. I only have one VCR, so I was I made fifty copies, one at a time. You know, real time. Obviously, <laughs> it has to record. So I was just on like clockwork, switching them out like eight times a day. Uh, I printed out VHS covers. I found the templates, made sure the size is good. I found actual VHS tapes, like buying in bulk. And, you know, some of them were not good. You know, that's the risk you run. Uh, I bought the clamshells. I bought the labels. And pretty, you know, it was a lot of work <coughs> just to do it ourselves. But they sold. You know, I only have like eight more, eight left out of 50. 
And then the Blu-rays and DVDs, you know, this company, Kunaki.com, took care of all everything else. And the test copies looked great. And the, the quality looked great. So I was like, why not go through this route and try it? And then we did. And then we set up an Etsy store. And that's how we sold out of all the Blu-rays. So there are no more Blu-rays. I don't know when I'm going to re-up it again. But, you know, maybe in the future, I'll probably add something different next time. And then the DVDs, I only have like 10 left. And, you know, they've been selling really well. So yeah. this so, experiment of doing it ourselves has <clears throat> been very, very, very yeah. successful. We wanted to try our hand at it just to to get the experience of it because we've gone the distribution route we know how that plays out and we're just like eh, not really impressed with the results and we're like why not try it ourselves i mean yeah. we're, it was an experiment. we're not afraid of some hard work so we <laughs> made the expenses up front to do all the orders of all the stuff and then uh, when the things arrived then we just did everything ourselves all the packaging and shipping and everything and that was a crazy trip to the post office <laughs> oh my gosh oh yeah oh yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. It was crazy but um it was really fun it was really exciting to see because that's i feel like at least for me with a distribution deal it's hard to be kept in the loop of how how your movie is performing right how many copies are being sold how Where are many, they going to yeah well, how how well is it doing over over here in the united states or across or whatever and we don't really get kept in the loop no, we don't get reports of how our, our movies are performing yeah. we don't know how what the sales are and with doing it this way with the self-distribution we know exactly where these movies are going because we're right. shipping them our right. so it's been so fun to see like oh my gosh they're going to spain and they're going to the uk and they're going to australia like, france <laughs> And Australia, like, how do these people even find out about this? Like, some people were Singapore. It was just so crazy. And the insane, internet. That wonderful thing the that we talked day. about. The internet. Exactly. <laughs> so it's just been so cool to see uh, for ourselves where the movie is going. Mm -hmm. And um, to also just be, like, extra grateful to these people. Like, we get to see their names and see who these people are that are supporting the film and also you know all the funds that we've invested into the movie coming back to us instead of a business so the distributor. somewhere that we're never going to see a set right. of that so instead of making money for some other business and having people like it is it was very exciting for our first couple movies to see them and best buy and barnes and noble it was like whoa oh my god <laughs> our, our movie is freaking target it's crazy so that experience it was fun but we to be honest we never saw any money from that right we have yet to see any income from any of our distribution deals and we don't want to do that again because we're right. like why why just sign away this movie that we put so much work in let's try to distribute it ourselves and see see what happens and yeah, we only saw well. yeah we only saw mo uh, money from those previous re um, releases uh, because we kept our digital rights. So I put it on Amazon and Tubi and, and went through Film Hub. And so that's how I actually saw money. Yeah. And so we did the same thing with Slash Art Party just very recently. It um, was, It's on Amazon Prime right now for free, Amazon Prime. And it will be uh, on other platforms probably fairly soon. Um, so digital release is ours and also the physical release uh, this time. Well, that it's okay. So it sounds like you've had the experience all around. I mean, so definitely you're, you, you, you were two people to speak to about that. And it's because uh, I have like access one and two distributed through screen time films. And I see a dollar, a DVD. It's there. There are no Blu-rays, but dollar a DVD. And I don't see anything else They're They're on Tubi and there's commercials where's my commercial money? And then right. I put them on YouTube on my own channel, not knowing, because mm -hmm. I actually did a search that there's um, a channel that's called something like Watch Movies Now, and they're on that. Hmm. So it's like, wait, uh -huh. where's my money from that? And, and then yeah. an interview that I just did with a filmmaker, I told him, oh yeah, I was able to watch your movie on Tubi. And he goes, what's Tubi? It, like, he didn't know what it was. And I explained to him what it was. And I said, oh, yeah, it's got commercials and all that. He's like, wait, commercials? 
I'm not making any money off of commercials. So, yeah, so it, it sounds like the route that you're going now with Slash Rep Party is probably the better one to go. Yeah, maybe it's not in Target yeah. or, or some of these places, you know, but, right. you know, you have more control. You know where it's at. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. More control and, you know, we're in charge of being the promotion. We're in charge of spreading the word. You know, that, thankfully, like the actors, they help a lot, too. because They have all friends and family that want to buy it. So they tell them, hit up Paul, you know, and go get it from their store. Or they'll buy copies. Hey, I want to buy five so I can, you know, give it to them. It's like, okay, cool, cool. Yeah. Again, because we don't see the reports, I can't like say for sure. But I have the feeling that people have been more inclined to buy it from us than from. Oh, it's out at Barnes and Noble somewhere. Okay, I'll get it someday. I'll, I'll get, right. I'll go back there and pick it up. But when they know it's from us, they're like, oh, I get to support you guys. Yeah. Then yeah, I want to get that from you guys or as we're hanging out with people they're like hey by the way do you have any copies of your movie can i buy one right now and we're like yes i'm in my trunk i got right a bunch now. right here <laughs> <laughs> and with the previous films it happened all the time with streets of vengeance that we would go to events or we would meet people and they'd be like can i buy a movie off of you and we'd be like we don't sell it because we it's distributed through a legit yeah, we company license it to we license it to someone we don't have copies if we were to give someone a copy we would have to buy it first or target ourselves then sell it to you uh, which is kind yeah of it just didn't make any sense so that's why we wanted to do it ourselves so we have the copies we can sell them we can give them out for free whatever we want to do sure okay. it's not beholden to anyone else and um yeah i am going through film hub for the digital distribution and for the first time i am seeing money from film hub because you know it takes a while for like them like they go by quarters and stuff so I did like last week. I saw money from Film Hub for Streets of Vengeance. So I was like, oh wow, very cool. Yeah. You know, like okay, like it's working. You know, like at first yeah. I wasn't sure because um, uh, I don't know if you know Jay Horton. If you know who he is. Uh, he's an independent filmmaker. He has his own YouTube channel. He talks a lot about um, distribution, and Film Hub is something he would champion a lot. And so that's how I got the the idea from him to try out Film Hub. And then um, from other filmmakers using Funaki.com. So it was an experiment for this film. And yeah. I, we like it. And we think we're going to go with it for the next one. As well. I think so, yeah. It was a good experience. Yeah, yeah I'm signed up on Film Hub, but I just haven't used it yet. So, because um, I, I think that's how Aximus got around, is that uh, Todd Cook from, you know, uh, Screaming Time Films, I think went through Film Hub. And then they put it out, but right. I, I wouldn't know any of this stuff because I'm, I'm right. not notified on it. So, Damn. and, and Kanaki is awesome, of course, because yeah. you, I mean, it looks, I mean, just like you bought it right off the rack. And I love yeah. that they, they let you do these little inserts. I think are yeah. great. Yeah. They let you do yeah. They're awesome. That was great. Yeah. Yeah. Otherwise, was it's fun. just looking like that. That's so boring. Right. Yeah. Yeah, it has you... a signed version, so it doesn't have the shrink wrap on it. But if if people just wanted to buy a copy from our Etsy shop, with just as is, they are shrink wrapped like a legit movie you would mm -hmm. buy at a yeah. store. Yeah, because you want us to sign or something. Then yeah, open it we up. only open it to sign if people want us to. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And there's and I've noticed that people will say, "Well, if I if I sign it, I got to take it out of the wrapper." Yeah, mm -hmm. you know, so it's not as secure. So you know, and and it's just. Some, some of this stuff, you know, it's, yeah, I mean, it just looks, I mean, per, you would never guess. It just looks professional. Yeah. I mean, it is professional, but it, it, it's, I mean, I can swear that if I told somebody I bought this from Walmart or I bought this from Target, they'd be like, oh, I'm, I'm going to go buy one. That they would know no yeah. difference that it's from Kodaki. Absolutely yeah. not. Yeah. Times are changing, man. Things, technology is getting so much faster and better than yeah. what it used to be before. I'm excited that the, the people and the artists are getting those opportunities in their own hands instead of having to rely on other companies and other, other distributions that, I mean, yeah, I don't want to knock them, but it kind of feels like they can kind of take advantage. Yeah, because there's a novelty. The things that they offer you are like, wow, you know? But it's like, well, now I can do that myself. Um, well, it's not so novel anymore. Right. Yeah, yeah, more and more people are using it. And the nice thing about being in Vegas is they're right above me. If I order something, it takes two days to get here, like two, three days. Really? So, yeah, wow. yeah, because I'm in Vegas, they're in Reno. So it's only... Oh. Yeah, so it's it's not too far above you guys being in LA either. So it shouldn't take that long for you to get it. But 
cross country. Yeah. I mean, it will take somebody a while, but yeah, otherwise this is yeah. right above us. So and they're pretty fast yeah. with stuff. So, um, yeah, fast. very fast. Yeah. Like, you know, 200 copies in like a week. So. It's so exciting too. I gotta say, it's so exciting to do place those orders. And then when you get the boxes delivered, you just open this box of hundreds of your movie. It's <laughs> like, wow, oh my gosh. <laughs> This is crazy. We made this. And they're all gone. It's weird. And they're all so <laughs> now it's an empty box. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's the nice thing about when you get that box and you open it. I've noticed I've done the same thing is you take a picture of all the, you know, all the DVDs or Blu-rays in the box. And you're like, look what just came in. And it's just that whole box of your movies. Yeah. And, and yeah. it's. It's almost like when you do see somebody go to Target or whatever it is, they take a picture of the film just on the shelf. But well, that's like yeah. one movie, one or two movies. Right. So it's kind of the same, but I think it's a lot better getting that box with like a hundred of them in it, just sitting oh, yeah. there. And like you said, yeah, it's like, right. look, I made this. This is my movie. And that was like a hundred of them. Who would have thought? It was a great feeling. Yeah, it was a great feeling when getting that first 200 copy shipment at yeah, our house and just these huge great. boxes on our porch. It's like, wow. And then opening it up. Yeah, that feeling is unreal. Different. <laughs> <laughs> When we went live and we're like, okay, you can purchase them. It was just like, oh my gosh, there's so many orders. Cause we're like, how many people are going to want one? Like five? Mm -hmm. I don't know. You know, yeah. you never know how many people like are truly interested until you go live and then you get the orders. We don't like to be like overly confident and say, oh yeah, I'm going to sell thousands, you know? <laughs> so we try to like be modest and just, yeah. you know, not go too crazy. But then when the order started coming in, we're like, oh, my gosh, people have heard of this movie, I think. Yeah. <laughs> so it's yeah. so exciting and that you wouldn't be able to get from a distribution deal. So that was really exciting. Right. Oh, no, not not at all. And and yeah, just because you mentioned that going to the post office is crazy and 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 it is. And it's but it's that great feeling of printing up that label and sticking the film in the bag and you know, actually taking it down and you got those two boxes or whatever it is full of the, the movies. And you know, that soon enough within like a week or so, people are just going to be watching your movie. Oh so my gosh. yes. And then the days that followed our notifications on getting tagged and all the reshares and people are like, pictures. I got my movie. I'm watching it. I'm watching it. I'm watching it. We're like, mm -hmm. This is crazy. Yeah. So yeah I, I love doing that. I love yeah. taking my, just my hand and I, and I just hold it, you know, in front of the camera take the picture and say mail day look what i got today because yes. it's it's nice distributing other you know or, or uh, posting other people's films like look i'm supporting this filmmaker you should too and and you know these things aren't like a hundred dollars or fifty dollars i mean i think the highest i paid is 20 for somebody's mm -hmm. movie which is fine because you're still supporting them yeah. so yeah. It, it's important to that. yeah yes. to you know to to do that and that, that, that's that's how it, it's all it's all that kind of stuff that's how we get people to watch our film because when it came out on amazon prime or you know, just recently or even just the blu-rays other people say slash luck party they'll like though i love that title what is it about or this movie looks cool or i like the cover i'm gonna go watch it so people like you and people like us all sharing each other's movies that's how we spread the word and find potential people who will yeah. watch the movie and buy it it makes our day to see people like you say oh mail day look what came in the mail and we're like oh, that's all right yeah Somebody <laughs> bought it. Or sometimes it's someone i don't know at all like i i'm not their friend they don't follow me i don't follow them and someone else will tell me like hey this, they'll tag me in someone else's post and I'm like hey man thanks you know i'll always thank people for buying our film and watching it and you if they didn't like it i still thank you for, for checking it out <laughs> yeah exactly even if you don't like it yeah. thanks for even giving the time <laughs> checking it out <laughs> thank I get you. it we know thank you for the yeah. thumbs up even though you gave it a thumbs down but you know that's... <laughs> <laughs> we're not delusional we know yeah. you know not everyone's gonna love this movie yeah. so even... i'm grateful for all of it. yeah <laughs> well so what's then with with the success of slasherette party what what has happened to your guys careers then has have you seen uh what, what benefits has, has it gone up like are you what's going on yeah i mean for i mean career i mean it's not something that's like tangible as far as like oh you know more people know us i mean i guess that's that's an aspect more people know us from Slash Art Party than ever before. So it is a progress, it is an evolution 
when we started with Sacred Mile and Shoot of Vengeance and Slash Our Party. So this is our biggest film to date as far as notoriety. Um, more, so many more people were interested in it when it came out on Amazon Prime. Um, so it is getting a lot of attention. It, it has a lot of reviews, you know, some good, some bad, but, you know, it doesn't matter to me. Just it's being seen by more people. So if, if that's, you know, success, then yeah, I would say it's very successful. And of course, just monetarily, I mean, it's the most money I've made on any other film because we did it ourselves. So that is, you know, a huge factor that's in the success of the movie. So yeah. for that, yeah. So for that, then yeah, it is our most successful movie to date. Um, and it's something that's getting us more notoriety. And I think it's because... I don't know. I, I think it's the title. I don't know. Like I see a lot of people say slash the rent party. Like I love that title. It like, sounds cool. Like what is that? What is that? Right. And it was the title that we were like not sure on when we first came up with it. It's we like joking with... around. I was just yeah. joking around because Paul's like, we should make it like a bachelorette party. We need it slashed. Like like slash lorette party. Like, <laughs> and he's like, That's yes. how it works sometimes. I was like, no, that's so silly. <laughs> <laughs> the stupidest title I've ever said but it's easy. Perfect. Yeah, perfect. <laughs> and um, you know, yeah, so and, and I think also the, the artwork is a big contributor to the, the success of the movie too. Uh brutal posters, the the, the latest artwork that's on the Blu-ray. Uh, he's amazing it's from the UK. Yeah. Uh, we had um, Chad uh, Keith. Yeah, that looks that's nice. Yeah. Artwork. Yes, yeah, so that's brutal. So that's posters. brutal posters. Mm-hmm. Chad Keith did the po- did the artwork on the DVD. So we had two amazing um, artists uh, do the covers for us, and you know that's a big you know factor in the marketing of the movie that like, catches your attention. You know, so for yeah, so as far as success for us, it's great. Uh, a lot more people know us. A lot more people uh, trust us. You know, Indiegogo is a you know it's a thing that can be abused by a lot of filmmakers. A lot of people feel um, you know kind of. Uh, cheated because people were starting to go those and nothing will ever happen or you know what happy whatever um, so far we had a good track record because um, we want to do it again for our next film um, but you know like it's always been even if we don't make our goal it doesn't mean we're not going to make the movie so we'll always put our own money into it obviously you know so um, for the next one we just hope to streamline it more and go again with this model of releasing it being our own. Yeah, pretty much any money we make from the movie, we're basically just turning it around and investing it into another project. Mm-hmm. So that's been uh, pretty exciting for that. And uh, like I said before, we both work daytime, full-time jobs. So that's our nine to five, Monday through Friday. But mm-hmm. uh, nights and weekends is when we do our art, which is writing and planning and Mm-hmm. and dreaming up new crazy ideas for the future <laughs> and, uh, we'll see what comes up with the next thing uh with each project that we do we try to involve a lot of our community here uh the artists that are local to us as well as bringing in like a guest spot or a couple of cameos uh, of people that have like a big like a bigger following maybe and uh just to kind of help boost some awareness of the, of the project mm-hmm. and uh, we're, we like how that model's kind of worked for us for the last two films, and we're probably going to just keep expanding on that and yeah. trying to, in the next project, expand even more on the cameos and the names and uh, including more local people that we work with. And mm. every project we do, when we meet new people, we try to keep bringing them back with us if we can uh, and if they want to. So <laughs> we, we build the pretty tight unit and that's why we have a lot of people that we trust so um, I don't know where I was going with that <laughs> <laughs> I think yeah, we're talking about the success oh yeah so the success of the film is that we we finished this project even with a global pandemic at the end of it and i um, happy we were able to fulfill all the Indiegogo orders I'm really happy with the feedback that we've had and the cast is so exciting like I said, a lot of them are first-time actors, so them getting to see their movie come out on a Blu-ray or on Amazon, they're just like, oh my gosh, I'm in a movie. That's crazy. 
And so um, their success is our success as well. So we get to oh, yeah. share that experience. <clears throat> and uh, we can't wait to basically replicate it and just try to expand a little bit each time. We're not uh, delusional and thinking like, my next one's going to be a million dollar budget. Mm-hmm. We're like, no, we're just, if we can expand by five or $10,000 every time, then I mean, that's success to us. So we were able to do that with this one. And now with our next one, we'll set our goal a little higher. And We'll see. See what we can do with that. Mm-hmm. It sounds like a, a great plan and a good working model. It's worked for us so far. Yeah. Ten yeah. years. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, and even the the Blu-ray here, um, the you, you got some good special features on here. So I, I wrote down there's a the you got a documentary um on here that's the uh slash fam for life the making of slash rep party that's 47 minutes that's a good documentary yeah that's no two or three minute thing that i've seen on other movies uh then you have the fantasy world of ginger lynn allen a mini doc so that's cool uh that's uh 25 minutes um and then you got uh, bloopers and outtakes and that's 12 minutes so you got Mm a good set of special features on here so you know just not the movie alone i mean you're getting a bunch of good special features too to watch yeah so that's that's really nice we figure that people if they're taking the the chance on us to spend the the 10 or 20 dollars on us we try we want to give as much as possible not just the film itself because we hope the film alone delivers hopefully but even if not, we hope that we can deliver extra you know, special features so that they can feel like, oh, well, I didn't really care for this part. But now that I've watched the making of, I kind of like these people and I kind of <laughs> like what they were doing and I have a new appreciation of the movie. Let me watch it again. And I've been surprised that like this happened a couple of times where people are like, I was kind of like eh, on the movie. But then I watched all your guys' behind the scenes stuff and your making of and I liked you guys so much that I went back and watched it again. And now I like the movie because that's it makes great. Sense to me and watching the behind the scenes, like, like what you guys were doing and seeing how much work you were putting into it, it gave me a different appreciation for the movie. Yeah, I thought you guys were a bunch of idiots before, <laughs> but now you guys are lovable idiots. So like, <laughs> you gotta be a little stupid. And if we can win you over with our personality or make you laugh or whatever or endear you and endear us in any way, then, you know, that. That, that goes a long way. It really does. Because we're all just trying to do something. Here, you know? We're right. all just trying to be creative. And we don't think we're better than anybody. Or, you know, <laughs> or think we're genius, we don't like take that. ourselves too seriously. No. For sure. no. And if you watch behind the scenes and you'll see us have fun or make fun of each other or ourselves or whatever, then you know, you'll see that we're just like, you know, just like you, just like anyone else out there. Just You're just people. Yeah. You're just humans. Yeah. 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 I make right. some fun. Yeah, I'm trying exactly. to make a fun movie, and we have fun while doing it. Exactly. There's never a time where people are yelling on set or, right. or getting like mad, frustration. Yeah, tensions don't flare. That's not our style at all. It's like if you're gonna be angry and, and upset on set, there's no point making a movie. Like, why do you want to make a movie? It's supposed to be fun. Right. Yes, there's things that are challenging, but if the experience sucks, then why are you doing it? So we want to make the experience as fun as possible. That's again, back to the pre-production and the planning. That's why Paul and I do so much work on the pre-production and the pre-planning. So when we get to set, we can have fun with everybody. And we're not like, everybody shut up. I'm trying to think. <laughs> I'm trying to think my way out of this problem. <laughs> I've seen that. We've on seen that sets. on other people's sets. And oh my gosh, it's so I feel absolutely cool. I'm so stressed. I feel stressed for them, but <laughs> we never want to have that kind of experience. We want everybody to just like be able to look back and be like, it was so fun. Everybody was so nice. Everybody had a good time. Yeah. And it was a great experience. That's that's our goal. And then if people like the movie, then even better. Awesome. <laughs> well, that's awesome. That that is that is really great. And now we have come to that time. So I'm going to ask uh, one more question and then, um, well, actually I'll ask two more questions. Uh, the first one is, so you mentioned like Amazon Prime, where can people see slash rep party? Where can they see your other work? Like what, what links can I put down below for people to, to go catch your films? 
Okay. Well, uh, our two previous movies, Think of the Maya and, and Streets of Vengeance, the DVD and Blu-ray are available on Amazon.com or Target.com, any online retailer, pretty much. Yeah. So if you want to find a, a physical copy, you can look for it on Walmart, yeah, Target.com, Target, anything like that. Streets of Vengeance, uh, if you want to just watch it streaming, it's streaming on Amazon Prime. It's streaming on Tubi, so you can watch it for free. Uh, it's streaming on uh, Zumo, uh, Plex, a couple of other channels. But Tubi is very popular, so you can mm-hmm. check it out for free. Uh, Slash Let Party is also on Amazon Prime for, for free. Uh, if you're a subscriber. Uh, it's not on Tubi yet. It will be on Tubi probably pretty soon. Um, but that's the only place you can really watch it streaming right now is Amazon Prime for, for Slash Let Party. Thank you for my, our first film is not available digitally anywhere yet. Um, we're working on that. But Streets of Vengeance, 2B TV, Slash Art Party, Amazon Prime. And if you want a physical copy of Slash Art Party, we have an Etsy store. We do have an Etsy store, AP Films. Um, we only have DVDs and VHS tapes left at the moment. All Blu-rays are sold out. For now. For now. For now. Okay. <laughs> Okay, good, good. So I'll, I'll get those. I'll have you send that all that to me, and then I'll put them up, uh, put them down in the comment area. Um, and then the last question would be: um, Is there anything that uh, you guys would like to plug? It could be from the past, it could be present, future. What would you like people to know about? Uh, well, right now, um, this year I've started writing uh, new uh, projects. I have a project called Wrestle Babes and the Heavy Metal Demon Massacre. Working. <laughs> um, I always want to do a wrestling um, movie. <clears throat> and um, I'm really proud of the script. It's done. 100 pages. Ready to go. It's going to be our most ridiculous project yet. Yeah. yeah. It will probably be our, <laughs> our biggest project as well. Yeah. So that one, uh, I, we finished writing it. I'm setting it aside and I started writing a more accessible project. Uh, only fangs the vampire movie um kind of get the gist of it just from the title <laughs> and uh, i'm writing that right now and i my deadline is to finish it by the end of the year so we can start shooting it next year probably in the spring early summer um so i'm really excited about that i've always wanted to make a vampire movie i love fright night love lost boys of course monster squad he loves twilight yes no. Oh, <laughs> no. uh, Lost Boys and Fright Night have been on repeat uh, on for me as I write. So Only Fangs is probably the thing we're going to be doing. Okay. All right, cool. So then we'll get as much info um, of that as possible. I'm, I'm hoping that your, your vampires don't glitter. Um, so since, you know, uh, apparently Twilight is your favorite movie from what I understand. <laughs> and (laughs) so all right so that that wraps up this uh this episode of one filmmaker one film i want to thank both of you for being here this was great and um, i learned a lot hopefully our audience did too and uh this is this interview will come out the week of halloween so it won't be this coming wednesday but the next wednesday because uh, I wanted to do a, uh, I want to do a horror film for the week of Halloween, so oh, <clears throat> that will come out that week. And um, yeah, and I guess that's that's about it. Unless there's anything else you would like to let people know. Um, no, I mean we have some free films on YouTube. If you want to see some of our previous films that are not horror related, uh, we made a movie called Rough Cuts, more French and Wave type of movie, La Soldadera. It's a Mexican spaghetti Western kind of film. And we have a short film called Nighttime Creatures, which we did a lot of people from the Slash Party cast. Uh, AP Films on YouTube, or you can search my name, Paul Ragsdale, R A G S D A L E. Uh, type that drivers yeah, and I do another Paul That's He's better not than me. this Paul Ragdale. Look for me, and uh, you can watch our some of our films for free. We have our trailers on there and short films and things like that. Exactly. Okay, perfect. Well, hopefully, you know, send all that info to me, and I'll and I don't care if there's a thousand links on there. I'll I'll post whatever it is to have people check out your guys' stuff. So, 
Um, all right. So I'm going to uh, say goodbye yeah, to everybody. Average. So, right. <laughs> all right. Well, we once again, so thank you. Thank oh, you. I, I appreciate thank you, so much, you. Thank you. Oh, thank, yeah. Yeah. Thank please. For watching. Yeah. Thank you, everybody. Thank, thank both of you for being here. Please check out, you know, slash rip party. Am I holding it right? Yeah. There we go. Yeah. So check this Ooh. out. And there are other films. And I will talk to you on the next One Filmmaker, One Film. Bye. See you later. Hey, everybody. Thanks for hanging out after the video. And uh, thank you for watching the very first Dark Park Films sponsored video. And who is that sponsor? Well, I've now learned if I do this with my hands, they go to the right area. There we go. That would be Wildlife Command Center Coffee, and you can purchase it right there. You can go to their website, which is uh, buywcc.com, and pick up their coffee. Uh, they have uh, two blends, which I'm going to show you now. Um, the first coffee is this one right here. Uh, this is a breakfast blend. It's 10 ounces, and it is a medium ground. Um, and it does say, and it's breakfast, like I said, and this is what it says right here. It says, uh, early bird can catch the worm. So there you go. A breakfast blend coffee that helps you catch the worm in the morning. And um, I really like this one. I'm more of a, a, a breakfast kind of blend coffee guy in the morning. Um, so this one I, I really like. Um, it has that little bit of oomph to it to kind of get you moving, uh, you know, get you up and out. And uh, so I really enjoy this one. But that doesn't mean that I don't like the other one, which is this one right here. Uh, this is a dark roast. It is also 10 ounces. And both of these are $7.99 at their website. Pretty good price for 10 ounces worth of ground coffee. Um, this one is, um, it's a little darker. So it's, you know, I think it's better for drinking at night. Maybe if you're, you know, writing a screenplay or if you're filming, uh, this has got that oomph oomph, that double punch to, to get you going. So um, this is one that I also recommend. I like both of these quite a bit, uh, but I, I kind of do, you know, the breakfast in the morning and then the dark more at night. Um, so I recommend both of these quite a bit. And um, how did I find out about these two, you know, uh, these two coffees here? And how did I find out about uh, Wildlife uh, Command Center? Well, when I was working um, on uh, Night of the Zom Ghouls, there was a box of coffee that was just sitting there filled with coffee. And we didn't know what to do with it. Like, whose is this? Who brought it? Why, why is it here? And so we just kept going to the store and buying coffee. And then one day I said, why don't we just get the coffee out of the box and use that instead of, you know, wasting money on going to Smith's or whatever and, and picking up coffee. So we did. Uh, we did not realize that it was um, the Wildlife Command Center coffee and uh, that it, you know, was sponsoring the movie. And it was great coffee. Everybody loved it. And we just went right through it. By the last day of filming, this coffee was gone. And uh, I went and found out, you know, about Wildlife Command Center, asked if they would like to be a sponsor for Dark Park Films, you know, for their coffee. Um, as many of you know, I love coffee. I love coffee mugs. And so this was a perfect match. And Wildlife Command Center is great with animals. So they provide a great service for rescuing animals. So it's kind of that double whammy for me where coffee, helping animals, you can't go wrong. And they were even cool enough to send me, get in there, a coffee mug because they knew that I liked coffee mugs. And right now, I don't get that. Oh, 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 oh. A little bit. I want to go on the keyboard, but there's their. That's their uh, dark blend because I'm recording this at night, so I am. I am actually drinking that while recording. Um, also, one thing that you can get at their website, which is cool, is you can get this 
there you go. This pocket knife, uh, which is nine forty nine, and um, this is pretty cool because it has their name on it. Uh, you know, Wildlife Command Center. We can catch it, and this is what it looks like. Put that down there. There we go. Fully, fully out. So you're getting like the bottle opener. You got the corkscrew. You got a screwdriver. You got a blade, and then you got this little hook thing that you can pop it into something that doesn't have a tab and then um, you know the liquid or whatever in there will come out. So this is pretty cool. And um, I'm just gonna keep mine in my car because you never know, you might need a pocket knife. So um, please support them. I'm gonna have links down below, uh, you know, where you can you know, check out just the uh, Wildlife Command Center. Um, I'll also have a link for Wildlife Command Center Coffee. And uh, it will basically be for uh, both these guys right here. And uh, please support them. Um, I support them. I think what they do is pretty awesome. And, um, you know, maybe this coffee will, will be on your set or in your kitchen. It will definitely be, you know, on my set in my kitchen. I know that. So uh, please, once again, I'm going to show you these. Please go to their, their website and uh, pick up their coffee and make it, uh, make it part of your day or night, depending on which one you, which one you like. So uh, that'll be about it. I really appreciate it. Thanks for hanging out with me. And uh, yeah, so thank you. And uh, once again, please, uh, please support uh, my channel. Please support uh, the Wildlife Command Center. And I will catch you later. Bye.